from fabulous Los Angeles, California, Hollywood, home of the stars, the magic factory where dreams come true, culture capital of the world, jewel of the Pacific, it's the Adam Carolla Show. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. No choice but to get it on. Mandy, get it on. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much in advance for sharing the good news with a friend and a co-worker and such and so on. Uh, lots of good stuff planned. Uh, old buddy Ray Oldhoffer's coming in here and a couple of few. Um, Brad Williams, comedian Brad Williams, calling in because he has a funny in-flight dog story to share with us. He told me and Drew a couple of weeks ago, I told him to save it for the air. And uh, also uh, director, actor, Bear Jew, Eli Roth, coming in here. <laughs> Real good guy. A um, <clears throat> couple things. First, first, first things first, pain and gain. You reviewed it yesterday. Yeah, we talked about it yesterday. And I said they kept hitting that thing, a true story, based on a true story. And, you know, and even halfway in or three-quarters of the way in, they're like, can you believe this is a true story? Yeah, they paused and I, the film. I said, how can it be true that the rock's toe got shot off and he went and found it in a murky pond when the cops were shooting at him the whole time? And then you said. What did I say? Shit. I said it's a true story. You, you said, said it had to be true because it kept coming up. Yeah, you oh, said, it was a character. Yeah, the, the toe is a recurring character. Yeah, you said point maybe not point. that particular point was true, but right. certainly getting his toe shot off was I true been, because it, was, it kept coming up. Someone tells me if Adam is bringing it up and going into length like this, it's not going to turn out that you were right, Brian. It never turns out. The, the two, the, here's I your, can't figure out your way to prove my point like that. Here's how you know you're in trouble. <laughs> I either bring something up or I go, can I get a picture of you and your dog? <laughs> <laughs> like if I chase you down by the baggage carousel, it's never going to be good. And what's your cover? You just you're thinking of getting a dog. People are so them? exquisitely narcissistic that you can just go. I want to take a picture of you and your dog, and they immediately hold up because in their mind it's a trophy. In yeah. my mind, it's a sack that farts <laughs> and is covered with Lyme disease. But in their mind, it's it's like you can say to any kid, I don't care how fucking homely. You know, if you found Ben Stein when he was three years old oh. and you found his, you know, bald patch, glasses, horn rim right. glasses, <laughs> tweed bow, jackets. bow tie, tweed jacket. <laughs> if you found that guy, parents, when he was three and he went like, oh my God, I'm going to take a picture of your kid because he's so cute, but really you just want to make fun of how mm -hmm. ugly the baby was. They would happily hold. Right. No parent ever goes, oh, come on. My kid's fucking homely. I know, what you, I know all you're going to do is talk shit about my kid and how homely they are. You knew the same with anyone's dog their kid their anything mm -hmm. you, you all you do is feign a little interest in them and they immediately perk up See it's what I'm true saying? i know i know i've been thinking lately that maybe my dog isn't the cutest dog in the history of dogs maybe people are just blowing smoke up my ass just a wee bit all right do we have that wikipedia thing that uh i spoke about at length to gary before the show and there it is already uh you uh want to read that there in the me. Yeah. In the film, Paul Doyle robbed an armored truck and got his toe shot off. That sequence is entirely fictional. No member of the Sun Jim gang actually robbed an armored truck or had their toe shot off. Oh. Shot off. So now here's my point. You fucking say it's a true story ten times, except for a lot of things that happen in the movie aren't true. Mm. You're yanking my chain, man. I mean, that's bullshit. Somebody's got to... There has to be... Like, here's the thing. I can't just open a fucking burger joint and go 100% Kobe beef and it not be Kobe beef. True. There is, well, I can't open a gas station and go, here's how much is in a gallon. I can't say this is 91 octane if it's 87 octane. It's interesting to say that though, because if you say like, for example, calorie free, like on a product, the by law has to be like 90% calorie free. So that's right. funny. They play fast and loose with the, you know, based on a true story. It's like, well, it's a true story. But, but is there any there. legal... Well, there should be some sort of that? sanctioning board that says at least 72% of this must have happened. You can't have whole storylines. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a, the toe was a storyline. It was it, rec it was recurring several times after that point. Right. And so you're sitting there, as I was sitting there, going, God damn, I can't believe this is true. This is mind blowing. Of course, because I'm smart, I said, This never happened. He oh. never went and retrieved his toe. I wish blah, I was blah, smart. blah, blah. <laughs> it would be nice. But also, hey, you're smart enough to know you're not. It'd be yeah. awesome it's for me as well. Um, point is, <laughs> I knew it wasn't true. And thus, what else in the story wasn't true? And now it's a true story, except for you get to make up shit along the way. 
they showed the real characters at the end. But I remember in pictures and profile yes. shots and everything. And the one thing that wasn't true was they're much better looking in the movie. <laughs> Always seems to work what? out that way. Mm. All right. Big Cinco de Mayo, uh, Mangria blowout at my Malibu house uh, coming up uh, this weekend. That is Sunday and all the money's going to the Children's Hospital and the tickets are tax deductible. Only a few of the VIP tickets left. And uh, Jimmy's going to be there and Cousin Sal's going to be there. Howie Mandel coming by. Press the flesh with Howie. He insists upon it. He loves flesh pressing. He loves the flesh, flesh, the flesh. The, okay. Uh-huh. Anyway, you know what I'm saying. So come on out and uh, say hi and hear some really good music with uh, John Popper and Susanna Hoff and uh, all that kind of stuff. Tickets uh, still available. And speaking of flesh, I don't know if you guys uh, had a hit off this Crave Jerky, but somebody tweeted me. They said, I'm ruined for regular jerky, like the gas station salty, dry shit. You know, oh, the yeah. stuff like the Indians lived off of and Eskimos <laughs> still live off of. They shouldn't be able to put it in the same category as that it, kind of jerky. It is not. He, l- l- let me explain something. We drove to Merced four hours one way, four hours back. We had a whole thing of the Crave jerky in here. I tried the Chipotle. And I was like, somebody's got to go to the shop on Saturday and get that jerky. Uh, Chris, because he's a maniac, went and got a box of jerky, and we ate it all the way. I ate the box, too. Oh, my God. Because it had dust on it. So good. It smelled of jerk. Mm-hmm. Last night, Chris came up to me and goes, my mouth's so dry. I've been eating it all week. eat box. I keep them in That's the right. car. That's right. It's like all he eats puppy. now. It's all mm-hmm. he eats. So uh, today, came to the shop, ate two full packets, by the way, of the of of the chipotle like, can't get over the stuff low yeah. calorie high protein did you try it out i did it was delicious and when we were on stage and you said because i knew that when the, i knew that there was like a ton a, a buttload of more jerky than anyone would think they would ever need i figured we have a lifetime supply of jerky here and then when you said that you came and cleaned out the place i was like oh crap so i was happy that there's still jerky oh here. they got the cherry flavor like i said low calorie high protein more protein than an egg fat free no nitrates gluten free just unbelievable stuff and like i said i'll give you a fair warning you will be ruined now for jerky so this is good on the other hand you'll be like a junkie who has to travel with his rig you could get pulled over at the airport you know what i mean you try to bring that Mm -hmm. stuff into turkey you may go to some turkey jerky prison ironically they never escape (laughs) i mean you have to travel there's no 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 such thing as going to the gas station Mm -hmm. buying jerky once you get on this what i like about it on the back there's this little um, meter that says whether like how sweet or spicy it is unbelievable stuff anyway target cost plus world market vons it's all there or you can buy online at cravejerky.com enter the promo code adam for 10 percent off you will not you will thank me yes in the form of dried meats <laughs> all right so let's see uh brad is not on the phone <laughs> that's a funny conversation we had i said to uh gary on the way and i said uh all right, so we got Brad's going to call in. He's going to tell us about this story on the airplane. He said, uh, yeah. I said, well, what time's Brad calling in? He said, 7. When do we start the show? I said, uh, oh, well, don't have him call in right right when the show starts because I'm going to be talking about jerky. talking shit for a little while about uh, toes being blown off and things like that. Have him, uh, you know, have him call in at 10 after or something like that, 15 after. Let me talk a little. I don't want to put the guy on hold. He's big celebrities. I mean, he's not big, but he's a celebrity. You know what I'm saying? He's a comedian. <laughs> So I said, um, yeah, put him on, you know, don't, and, and, and Gary said, oh, no, 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 no. Brad's a big fan. He just wants to listen in. I said, yeah, but I feel weird. I have him on hold for 10, 15 minutes before we bring him on. He goes, that's what he wants to do. I said, okay. Smash cut to Gary, where's Brad? Hey, he's not on the phone. <laughs> You've grown up a lot. This is from the guy who used to keep co- love line callers on hold who called in before the show. All he the would, way to the he end. would keep regular oh. people on the phone it, that the long. End. It was insane on Loveline that the show was an out uh, was 120 minutes. It was two hours, and people would call in. We would open the phone lines half hour, 25 minutes. Whenever Brian waltzed in there, we'd do Waddle, it. Waddled in there. Waddled in. He was heavier <laughs> back then. Um, so he'd get in there and he'd just start answering the phone. So there, there were times when I would look at the screen toward the end of the night and someone be on hold for 144 minutes and i was like how's that even possible the show's not even oh you know there's five minutes and i realized oh they called in 25 minutes before the show started they were on and then sometimes we'd go to them they'd be asleep 
because they'd be, they'd be calling from the East Coast. Yeah. So it was uh, the wee hours of yeah. the morning. Anyone in their right, mi- right mind would have hung up, but they right. fell asleep on the phone. <laughs> it was still oh, phone. please. There are many of them who would pop right up as soon as I called them. Uh, as soon as I p- picked up with them. All right. Uh, funny thing at the dinner table tonight. I was talking to my daughter's friend. I like to do the what do you want to do? What do you like? What do you, what do you this? You know, my son, again, the super unsatisfactory answer. What do you want to do? So I want to be Iron Man. Okay, good. Write that down. <laughs> it's going to work. We don't have to pay for college. Uh, it must be Iron Man. That's not the answer I'm looking for. That's, mm-hmm. I didn't ask what you want to do later on tonight. I'm talking about once yeah. the pubes start popping. Yeah. So Future plans. Mm-hmm. Speaking of that, remind me to get back to this one. But, you know, I was, th- I was sitting around just thinking today, I don't get to see people with really bad skin anymore. I miss that. You know you what I mean? don't think it's your eyes? No. I mean bad oh, skin. Like, like the episode of Facts of Life where they made fun of the guy and they called him Pizza Face. Hello. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean... Back in the day, once in a while, there's two things I, I miss from my childhood. I miss the kid with the short leg who wore the add a, le- you know, add a leaf to the heel of the yeah. Nike, like he patted the, the Nike the out. The matchbook under the table leg. Yeah, of, one, of one Nike looked like Fred Gwynn's uh, elevator <laughs> shoes from the Munsters, <laughs> and then the other one was regular. Mm-hmm. I miss that guy. That guy doesn't exist anymore. And I miss the guy, you know, or the chick, where you just saw him and you went like, pfft. Anyway, yeah, I had the same ooh, reaction. It always bad, looked painful. Bad. Yeah, like, I think it was, it was painful. Well, I'm pretty I, sure that it, kind. Of, I think it's cystic acne, and I it's, imagine it hurts. It, no, I, I mean it's not only painful, but it's like, ooh, it's got to be tough. Yeah, you know, on dates, job, you know, applying Told, yeah. for jobs. Like you know, you just had that look on their face. You're like, what's that date like? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like, oh. Did you guys never have bad skin? I I've had my share of zits, but I didn't have bad skin. Mm-hmm. But I. There used to be the kids, Pizza Face. There was yeah. nothing you could do about it. And all the scrubbing and all the bullshit it turned out to be nothing but bullshit. It was in the days, I think. Right, right. Now I feel like everything's been solved. Yeah, I No think... one has really shitty skin anymore. Right. I kind of miss it. pills and things people take. Find me a guy with a short leg and bad skin to follow me around make me feel Na- better about myself. Who answers to the name Lucky? Brad? <laughs> uh, I have short legs and I could start eating a lot, a lot of pizza. I'll tell you what. Let's lengthen one leg. And see if we can't fuck up your skin just a little bit. It would be cruel to, to shorten the other one. Uh, Brad Williams calling in, uh, one of my favorite comedians. And um, we were talking to Dr. Drew when you were in about an experience you had on an airplane, yes? Yeah. And uh, this goes right along the lines of what you've been talking about with these uh, damn uh, uh, service animals. Uh, I was flying... I, I was flying first class, which, by, which by the way, you haven't lived until you've been a midget sitting in a first class seat and watching the faces of all the passengers <laughs> as they pass by and look down. And, oh, and it's such a awesome. fucking! It's such a waste. It's such a <laughs> well, like when I'm just looking at the bottom of your kid sized kids as I come by, you know, I mean, just looking at the soul. When I realize I'm going to the back and I'm going to be essentially blowing myself for the next four hours and your feet aren't even touching the ground. It's, it's like when I see like what it's like when I see Paris Hilton climb out of a two thousand two hundred thousand dollar Ferrari. I just go, oh, come on. Mm-hmm. It's wasted on her. It's waste. Yeah. She, she doesn't know what to do. She doesn't know what to so do. I'm, yeah. So, I, so I'm sitting there uh, setting up shop and the people are walking by me and they and like but when they look down and see a midget in first class they just kind of assume i'm a make-a-wish kid sure <laughs> that's right it's going to it's going to euro disney for his last trip mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh this was a red-eye flight and uh red-eye flights as you know you're supposed to sleep and so when you're supposed to sleep on the plane they turn down the lights they play a little soft music or whatever and you go to sleep um on this plane they were not turning down the lights. The lights weren't going off. And then I asked the flight attendant what was going on. And she said that uh, one, of the, <clears throat> excuse me, that one of the passengers has a service dog on the plane. And if the lights go off, the dog is afraid of the dark and the dog will bark. Do you, do you see what we've become, people? <laughs> is this a good thing? Are we heading no. in a good direction? That's that's the one question I have to just ask. Is it good this direction we're going? And here's our problem. Our problem is is we we're like that that British boy band One Direction. 
We think everything. Like people go. I'm Harry. Well, You're adorable. I don't care about your hygiene, <laughs> sweetie. Let me finish my thought. <laughs> Weird thing to blurt out. Let me. We can probably edit that out. <laughs> Interesting non sequitur. Yeah. Hmm. Fun honeymoon. All right. Well, here's what I'm saying. Um, everyone does this thing where we get back to, oh, so uh, women now have the right to vote. We don't have a blink- drinking fountain for colored people and white people. You, know, you don't think that's a good thing? That is a good thing. But it's that's done. Mm. Now let's stop. <laughs> Because we're keep we're going like we're doing this thing like hey we're progressive hey we're progressive hey we're nah, knock it off every like I said it's gonna be me and Gilligan my service pelican on the plane you'll all be sorry when Gilligan shits on your entree and eats your fucking service dog well here's the thing I think this is fairly obvious any real service dog would not bark when the light would not be afraid of the dark like if your dog is afraid of the dark i believe that would mean that it is just a pet not actually the dog that you need Mm. to get around or to do other things that actual service dogs do yes i think we're supposed to draw the line when the service dog needs a service dog yes and and the fact that there was no such thing as a dog on an airplane unless you're richard belzer uh, a few years ago, and I'm convinced a year from now there'll be no such thing as taking a flight with a dog without a dog on it. It'll be like smoking and non-smoking. They're just going to have to have a kennel section in dogs for dogs on these planes. And if you're allergic or you have a problem with there, by the way, there are a lot of people are freaked out by dogs. Mm-hmm. There, I've met many people that have been bitten by dogs when they're little kids, and when they come to my house to do some work or something, they go, could you put the dog away, please? And I go, oh, she's real friendly. And they go, uh, could you just put it upstairs and shut the door, please, because I've had a bad experience. Like, It's irrational, but still it's a fear. Yeah, it's a it's, phobia. Every bit is real as whatever bullshit your dog is supposed to be doing for you on this flight. It may be doing it against someone else. I mean, whether it's dander or whether it's just the people that are just plain old freaked out by dogs— there are those people. There is that portion of the population. There should, there should be dog-free flights, and then there should be an airline, or there should be flights that are catered to your pet. I mm. feel like that would be such a moneymaker. Brad, you know what you need? You What's need a, a big service dog that you can ride. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like a bull mastiff. Just and a just... big, like a Rhodesian Ridgeback, and <laughs> you, <laughs> you put a cowboy hat on. And you get on that dog, yeah. and you ride it, and it's like I'd like they, to see a standard poodle. And they would no, Brett, Brett's, oh, standard, yeah, standard, yeah. standard, yeah. I think you can sure. handle a standard. I don't know, though. I feel like they rear back a lot. You might get thrown off a poodle. Yeah, I feel You'd like stick like Velcro. That's why I went with the ridge, ridgeback. Okay, I see where yeah. you're going. That's a ball grabber right there. You can't yeah. slide off the back of a ridgeback. It's Natural going the wrong turf direction. Built in, yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. You're right. You're right. You're right. I could mosey it on into first class and then grab the collar and give it a little whoa. Right. <laughs> right. Just to take it to the seat. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you make these kind of weird proclamations. There's only room in this first class for one dwarf on a Rhodesian Ridgeback. <laughs> and then you just, you, yeah, you, 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 you water them by the trough. Uh, so see, I'm- here, it'd be the, ul- the, the, it'd be the ultimate service dog because... You'd walk it. You'd come in on the back of your dog, and then you'd run right. into some cunt who was holding the little thing that had the servant. You're like, "What's your dog for?" And they, first off, they'd be sickened by you riding your dog. Mm-hmm. Like they'd be like, "Oh my god!" What? And you'd be like, "It's a service dog." And they'd go, "Dogs aren't supposed to work." Yeah, and you go, "What's your dog doing?" Well, it's for anxiety. Well, that's neither here nor there. That's almost that's that's less than a zero. I use my dog for transportation. That's how I got yeah. to the airport. I was going to yeah. keep him in the long-term parking. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to keep him over at Wally Park. They wanted see, too much. I'm riding him onto the plane. See, here, see, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking the way things are going, I'm going to be able to get two for one tickets pretty soon. Because let's say Ooh. I'm flying with, let, let's say I'm flying with a gr- with, with, with a girl of Hawaii. Right. She she pays for the ticket. I put on an orange fluorescent vest. I'm her service midget. Ah, uh, uh, and then Brad, and then I get to fly for free. Let me fix this for you. Two words, baby Bjorn. <laughs> Carries you right onto that plane. Right. Facing, no questions asked. Facing forward, ideally. Uh, make sure you so, shave. I'm just saying, you go so backwards just, with the baby Bjorn. No one's going to stop her from getting on the plane. Yeah, I right. just, I just, 
I just hop in like the kids from uh, the Hangover movies. Baby Carlos. <laughs> right, right, baby Carlos. Uh, yeah, my little weenus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or she wears the 10-gallon cowboy hat, and you just pop out of it mid-flight. What are they going to do, turn the flight around? I don't think so. All right. Uh, Brad, by the way, uh, you can find bradwilliams.com or bradwilliamscomedy.com, and you can uh, check him out and uh, tweet him over at uh, Funny Brad, if you like, at Funny Brad. Thanks so much, Brad Williams. We appreciate you calling in. Thank you for having me, Adam. Always a good time. Yeah, we're getting out of control. I told it. Everything that I complain about, I I pre-complain about, will happen. The dogs on the plate. The airports now have places for dogs to go potty. And let me say this, too. I I know this sounds sounds stupid, but you know that thing where they go, hey, when you go into a supermarket and there's somebody sitting there just eating grapes and someone goes, eh, so what? You go, well, you pay for that. I mean, it gets... The super, Built into the price. Yeah, yeah. pardon the pun. They're, they're not going to eat it. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when the city does something, when a supermarket, whether it's private sector or public sector, when something happens, it's not for free. It gets absorbed by everyone else who goes to the market. So if an airport is building a dog park so that they can go number two on some AstroTurf inside the main terminal, uh, 25 cents is getting added to everyone's ticket. You you may not have a dog. You may never travel with your dog, mm-hmm. but that thing ain't free. Right. Fucking assholes. Fucking assholes. Have hey, you ever traveled with Molly? No. No. I, I like, I, the, the only thing I, the only thing I do, uh, hey, uh, Gary, you want to know if Ray should come in? Is that what you're asking? You know, when I do this hand move like that? Because I'm not going to say it on the air. That'd be that'd be. Uh, You're telling to round third and score. That would. If I do this to your sign, that's unless you want to go. Yes, bring Ray in to the studio, but then that would interrupt our flow. So I don't want to do that. Gary no, we he, would not want to do that. Okay. Gary thought he was supposed to bunt. Okay. So uh, yes, my dog travels with me in my car and leaves fucking fur everywhere and slobber out the window. And then every once in a while, when I stop short, she falls off the front of the chair into the well where your feet go, <laughs> which is which is funny. What's going on there, Rezo? I'm good. Yeah. I had a, Molly, bad You're time. Right? had a bad time with Molly today, which is I said to Molly this afternoon, you want to go for a walk? And as soon as you say that to Molly, she's, she's up and... Then she'll follow you around the house. It's the cutest thing in the world. So you go, you want to go for a walk, Molly? And she'll go, yeah, <laughs> you know, do the Scooby thing. And then next thing you know, I'm just in the bathroom whizzing into this, I mean, brushing my teeth. And she, <laughs> she literally plops down on my feet. She never follows me in the bathroom, plops down on my feet. Mm-hmm. And then I'll get up and go to the computer and check something, and she'll plop down on my feet again. She's and so for the, wherever you go, she'll just plop down at your feet, except for then the phone rang. And it was a like kind of important phone call. I ended up talking to him for about 45 minutes on the phone. In which case, poor <laughs> Molly just like, what the fuck? We, yeah. You promise. And in dog years, that's like nine hours. Have you ever, have you ever <laughs> peed on Molly? No. Don't lie. Ray, I don't pee. Why would I pee on something that sleeps in the bed with me? Because you're, you're, doing, you're going to the bathroom, right? Right. If she, her head's right there. Oh, you mean just to wake her up? Yeah. Keep her honest? It's tempting. I do like peeing on things. You know, if I'm outside uh, so peeing. That's a yes. No, no. If I, the fucking dog sleeps in my bed, Ray. Yeah, at the feet. So what? <laughs> First off, Lynette would Coin detect toss. whiz on the dog's head. Dog's already suffered enough hardship with the with the. Uh, I peed on Molly's good ear. Yeah, I'm just the, saying. Yeah, it's probably why it needed to be removed. All right, there, uh, Ray Zo. What's going Taking on with you? It's funny that Leno's band played this when I came out on stage. And it's kind of awesome. Kind of awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. yeah. Uh, by the way, this segment is sponsored by MaximaStyle.com, the best selection for energy energy efficient LED bulbs. Like the ones we have here. And check us out. We all look really good. Damn, we do. Yeah, we do. All right, Ray, see a question you like up there? Nope. First, I have to say M-A-X-X-I-M-A style.com. Mm, now. What a pro. Bugs keep coming through his screens. 
windows. Hmm, old windows. Interesting. Door between which kitchen and garage won't close. I like door-related questions. I know you do. Mm-hmm. Justin? Oh, I guess yeah. you're taking that one. Fuck yeah, Sacramento. <laughs> you know it. 26 years of age? Yeah. Hold on, Justin. Did you own your own house? Yeah, I, I just bought it. I just oh, it my God. Years. It's like you're still in high school and you got a house. You're telling me, man. It's unreal. It's Justin, what did your wife put down on it? <laughs> Please. Uh, FHA, man. You only got to put down 3.5%. Ray, uh, Ray still What's living in an apartment. Mean? He's almost 50. still living in an apartment. I'm going to be 50 in 29 days. Justin, what if you had a kid and he was going to be 50 and he's still living in an apartment? Name him Ray. What's wrong with that? <laughs> so the okay, door. Run one of my extra houses by then. Yeah, yeah, you have a fleet of houses. Is by that true? Then. You only have to put down three and a half percent. No, an, I'm, I'm just waiting for the apocalypse. Oh. A Fair Housing Act loan. Uh, oh, it's, it's a longer process, but you only have to put down a small, much smaller percentage. Door between the kitchen and the garage won't close. Move, Justin. Yeah. Move now. Oh, oh shut <laughs> up! Immediately. <laughs> Top of the door. Hinge is almost to the point of splitting the wood. All right, so where's it rubbing? At the bottom? No, okay. So I went ahead and took the top hinge plate out because they have the door notched out so that hinge would sit flush with the door and same with the door jam. But they fucked up the notch on Hold the, on. Wait, the mortise? It's on... called a mortise. Okay. But... Yeah, you guys know the terms, man. Okay. So... All right, your name's Justin. Oh. Mm-hmm. His name's yeah. Mortis. <laughs> Mortis sounds like a nice Jewish boy. Your mama would have wanted. I'd marry him. So what's wrong with Mortis? <laughs> what? He's mom. He's so boring. But he's, he's not circumcised. His father's chess. a dentist. Come on, he's a solid. He comes from a good family. All right. Sorry, we're doing Yentl. What's going on, <laughs> Mortis? Mortis? Yeah, Mortis. Um, That's your turn. So I. I pulled. I just pulled it out, but that hinge, it, the mortise, is not where it needs to be on the door jam side. So like, it fits flush on the top part, but on the bottom part, the hinge is sticking out over the mortise. Ah, okay. And the door just doesn't close right. So All right. Can I just get with a chisel and yes. kind of? That's the way to do it. Well, here's what you would do. All right. First of all, you got to get square. Hey, okay, but if 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 somebody wants to mortise out something. Um, the hinge is not popped in. It's popped out. It's hanging out. Surface mount sitting on top of the jam. It's not flush. Yeah, don't get a chisel and just whack it because it's hard to go against the grain, cross grain with a chisel. Get a real sharp chisel. You can sharpen chisels, by the way. Or a router. Mm, this He's going to fuck it up a router. He doesn't have a router. He can't handle a router. Router's too much tool for him. The mortise is the little thing that the door the piece hinge, fixed, the, the, hinge the door snaps. gina. The, yeah, the door gina. That it snaps into. Justin, do you own a router? I don't. My dad. Okay. <laughs> His dad does. Yeah. Well, my dad has. His a small dad's also buddies of with Edward James, almost with the worst acne in the world. Huh? Nice time. All right, right. Just quiet down there. Hold on, I got more written down here. Uh, all right. <laughs> Here's the deal. Hold on. You take a utility knife and you cut around that hinge cut it cut it in cut it in cross it cut it real good and, and then also you pull the tamp it with a hammer right, race. fucking finish here for a second right cut it real good around the hinge you don't have to tamp it with a hammer what what do you want to tamp with the hammer because you want to get deep enough to bury that hinge uh, i i say once you cut it once you score it real good then you can pop the hinge off and use a sharp chisel and clean it up at that point all right no argument right. okay Right. I'll argue you later. Right. Means I'm right. All right, you got a call up there you like? What do you like? Uh, I like Wisconsin, just because I like Wisconsin. All right, does that have a number or a name next that to it? That has line four. All right, let's go to line one. Willie. And the Corey, 27. Oh, fuck. That's too yeah. backfired on me. <laughs> How's that going? All right, Willie. I tried. Hey, East Man and Ray, get it on. Call him from Wisconsin, 23. Now, there's no way you own a home at 23. No, I do not. I just graduated college. All right. Willie, if you were here, I'd kiss you. Go Badgers. Yeah, go Badgers. What's going on? So like the description said, I got a problem with a window in my apartment, and I have a cheap-ass landlord that won't pay for it. But I'm getting bugs that are getting through the screens and through, like, the the sides of the windows, and they're just infesting my place. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there's a way to seal them up without, 
I don't know, putting in a new window. Like mm. I said, my landlord is just too cheap to do that. I always like the look of foil on a window. It's classy. Mm. It says to the world, we're shooting porn, but not snuff porn. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's a mind room business. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, well, getting a screen that fits, and screens they'll make for you, it's, they're pretty easy. I mean, you measure the ID, the inner dimension of the window, and then you go down to the whatever store, and they'll make them for you. Now, keep in mind, what they're going to make for you is going to be square, and where you're going to put it is going to be a little out of plumb, a little out of square. And so even if the dimensions, and everyone has to remember this. You take the dimensions of something and you go, all right, it's 32 inches at the top and 32 inches at the bottom and it's 46 inches high. But if what you try to put into into that space is exactly square and the thing's a little bit racked, it ain't going to fit. It's not working. So feel free to deduct, you know, good solid eighth from, you know. Around everything. Around around everything. And by the way, where are the bugs coming in from? Do you know where? I mean, can you see them? Yeah. Because they might be getting from God knows where. They get through the screen, and then they're stuck in between, like, two panes of window glass, and then they get around the sides of the windows, too. To I just want to hear apartment. this guy talk because of that accent's just killing me. Keep going. Yeah. Accent? What? All right. And yeah. uh, what did you study in college, Willie? I went to school for construction management. Ooh. Is there such a thing? <laughs> uh, well, at my school there was. Uh-huh. So you're going to work <laughs> in the field? Yes, I do. I'm a project manager for a construction company. Wait a minute, you can't figure this one out. <laughs> well, how's that going? Something I didn't. Did study. you fail? Be great for the guy <laughs> building a you know commercial skyscraper for right now. Can't figure out the screen. Can't figure out this fucking screen. Oh, no, a pipeline. I got the 28. Oh, you're doing a pipeline. Yep, I work for a pipeline company. I like that. That means he smokes base. What goes on? More good stuff, right? Uh, what goes on? Do you bury it? Is it above ground? Some of it buried? Oh, so do, we do something called horizontal directional drilling where we'll drill. We'll take like a 36-inch or larger giant auger and drill into the ground and then shove a pipe through there for miles. Case or on, baby. Benches and then lay a pipe down there, too. Uh-huh. I bet what, you. I bet what are they drilling for, Ace? I is it know, natural gas? What are you doing? Like fracking? He's laying yeah, the natural gas. The one right now, we are actually doing the Keystone Pipeline, so... We see a lot of protesters, too, the, the pipeline that's going from Texas to Canada. Right. All right, so you guys are doing tons of fracking and doing all that kind of stuff and setting here's, it up north. Here's the here's what I don't understand about any of this, like Keystone Pipeline, stuff like that. I understand that everyone wants cars that run that run off of good vibes, but we, haven't, we don't really have that technology. Like the solar panel on the roof of your car mm-hmm. is just not going to run your car. So instead... We're going to just send over bundles of money to the worst people on the planet. We are going to take people that think it'd be a good idea to throw acid in the face of girls because they caught them reading Mark Twain and fucking just make them rich beyond anyone's wildest imagination. And then when somebody says, well, look, we got a lot of reserves in the shale here on the uh, on the West Coast or we can do a Keystone Pipeline. Everyone goes, not so fast. We got to bundle up some more money and send it to the worst place on the planet. And it's like, I understand conceptually what you're talking about. I'd like solar farms and wind farms and all that kind of stuff. But we're a good period of time away from that. I mean, we made an announcement somewhere in like, you know, Jimmy Carter, like, you know, 1972. We need to be oil and energy independent inside of 10 years. So, you know, it's like by 1980, independence from oil. Well, Exxon Valdez and all the other disasters that took place when the stuff, you know, when the tanker ships, you know, went, went aground and spilled all the oil all, all over the coastline and all that stuff. Like that notion, I, I mean, in terms of ideas in 100 years or 200 years, Berlin Wall versus sending the tanker ships to the worst place on the planet to give the worst people on the planet a whole fuckload of money so that they could get Taylor Swift to do like private <laughs> concerts for their nine year olds on just the idea spectrum when we're sitting on top of a ton of fucking energy. But what, what do you think is going to be looked further down on? I mean, uh, coin flip, coin toss. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. Let's build a fucking pipeline. We'll have a bunch of energy and we'll put a bunch of people to work. Do you think we will stop? 
uh, being dependent on the worst people in the world in our lifetimes? I, I doubt it. I I I think not it's, as long as Adam and I are friends. I think it's two. I think it's two things. I think first off, you whoever whatever companies bring it from here to there and have the deals with them, not on their fucking watch. Right. Like not as long as they have lobbyists that are going to make sure this shit doesn't happen. And not as long as there's, you know, a new generation of retards like Martin Sheen, who are going to chain themselves to bulldozers. Thanks, Marty. Thanks. We have no nuclear energy, but instead we have people dying in coal mines and sulfur being belched up into the fucking atmosphere because you chained yourself to fucking bulldozer in 1976, you fucking hero. Thanks, asswipe. Anyway, about the screen. (laughs) Figure it out. Hey, Willie? Yeah. Yeah, you keep going, and when those Sierra Club guys come around, you tell them to take a hike hike to hell, and you tell them I said so. I'll tell them that. All right, buddy. Good All times. Right. You know, my old apartment didn't have any screens, so it was constantly bugs. Are you, landlords supposed to provide screens? Um, Read your lease. It's it's all it's that kind of thing. Like if if you have rent control, they provide nothing. I didn't have that. So if you're paying like market value, then yeah. they should do stuff. What I like, which they have. Somebody tweeted me this, and they're right, and it doesn't work all the time, but it's like what stores have is that, like, air blade. Yeah. Okay? Because, all right, you're a supermarket mm. or a department store or whatever, and you got the doors coming open and close all all the time, right? Any commercial food service has yeah, to have. Yeah. And so why isn't your supermarket filled with flies? Oh, did they, they blow them out? They blow them out. I love that. Yeah. Right when you open the door, that... Yeah, that's to keep that's bugs the out. Air blade. I yeah. wonder can, if the can f- people get that in their houses and apartments. That's why Brad Marilyn Williams Monroe got it. <laughs> Brad Williams up on you. It's Brad, nice. Shut up, Ray, with your horrible jokes. Huh? That's why Brad Williams can't get into the Safeway. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that was a good one. It's worth waiting for. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Uh, and <laughs> caller number. Let's take another caller. Right. I'm going to check when the next closed mic night is over at the Improv to get <laughs> over funny. there. That's funny stuff, too. Are you done with the comedy? <laughs> so, Ray, about noonish. This is good. Monday? Fuck good. Off. All right. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Yeah. Take another call. All right, hold on a second. No. Uh, I'm wondering if there's one fly that's training, like, like a wedge buster. You know what I mean? Like one fly where they're like, you can fucking do it. Yeah. You can do it. You get a good head of steam. Be good children's book. You get a fucking good head of steam. You bust through that air knife, mm-hmm. and then we'll be behind you. It's like bump draft. That's right. You can bust through it. You can get it. Like you got to get the horse fly, Clydesdale fly. You got to get him beefed up. Come on, eat more of that dog shit. Let's go. <laughs> Training montage for the fly. A tiny fly blowing a tiny whistle. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. I'm not gonna lie to you. We're not all gonna make it. Doing a weird log roll thing on yeah. a piece of shit in a sewer. <laughs> Training. That's their treadmill. <laughs> Imagine the vignette. Oh, the, the great vignette. The, Fly beefs up. Right. And then he gets the, then he drops down. He's got to drop down and just get that fucking hard move so he can bust through that invisible hymen to get into the safe way. And mm-hmm. once he cracks it, they can all follow him in. Mm-hmm. It's like an old professor fly with a stopwatch. That's right. Like training him. Come mm-hmm. on, you can do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that. I like that idea. Somebody was telling me those big crane flies can't get through that stuff, too. They oh, don't no, have they're, all, they're all wispy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Ray, we good? Want to take one more? Yeah, one more. Basement is open stairway. Mm-hmm. Make it quieter. All right. Let's talk to uh, line two. Hey, Corey. Oh, my God. Hey, man. What's going on? What's going on, Corey? 27 Baltimore. Do you own your own home? Oh, and for the purposes of this conversation, absolutely. All right. Fucking liar. Such a winner. <laughs> you know, winner. born with a house, born into my own house. It's unbelievable. I love that. But, uh, oh, hold on a second. You guys tell me what etiquette is. I won't throw the guy's name out there because uh, Ray knows him not well. But um, I'm getting my hair cut the other day, and I sit, sit next to this dude. And we're just sort of having a little chat. And he goes, I think you know my sister. I think you went to high school with my sister. And uh, he throws his sister's name out, Wendy. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know her. Yeah, how's she doing? Oh, she lives up uh, in Portland or something. Oh, good, doing good, fantastic. How about you? What's, uh, what are you up to? He says, uh, well, so I got a house over there, you know, Studio City. I said, oh, well, good. Good for you. He said, yeah. I said, well, where is it? Said, oh, it's the same house. 
I said, oh, from when high school and stuff, when I used to come by? Yeah, still living there. Wow. And it's like, but the guy's 47. And so it's like, hey, I ate, the parents moved to uh, Palm Springs or whatever. And I had that thing where it's like, it went from, oh, you got your own place in yeah. Studio oh. City to, uh, 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 oh, there's another America. weird one where like, what? hey, I'm taking care of my parents now, right. but I never really moved out. Yeah. How's that going? I wasn't sure what, what my reaction should be on, on that one. My elderly neighbor across the street just passed away and he, he was 80 something. His parent, he was lived in the house his parents had lived in. So for in West LA since probably the early part of the last century. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. That's kind of at a certain point it's honorable. I think at it's a no longer point. sad. It sounds like a European thing. <laughs> it may have been. Maybe an immigrant. I'm yeah. laughing because my mom lives in my her mom's <laughs> flop house. It's kind of it's a it's a little lateral move from living in the same house. She bought a piece of shit for nine thousand dollars to rent out to people, mm-hmm. but. This is the problem. If you fuck with your daughter, then she's going to flop in your rental property for the rest of your natural life. And that's what happened. Uh, Corey, the hell were we? Did I put him on hold? All right. Corey. Yes, sir. Sorry. Basement. Open yep. stairway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is that where you're that's keeping right. your parents? <laughs> Under those stairs? Yeah. Is it creaky? No, it's not creaky. It's carpeted. Uh-huh. And your question is what? Uh, basically, I've just been putting up with my roommates uh, here and everything they're doing in the morning. I work a, I work a shift work, so every week I have a different rotation. So I can never get any sleep because all I hear is pitter-patter and people talking. So I'm trying to figure out a way, if there's any way to hang a sheet or do some, anything I can do, really, just to want to make it quieter. Well, yeah, well, but make what quieter? I don't, what's that do you to do live with in your... the basement? Yeah, so uh, I live in a townhouse, and I have two other roommates, and I have the basement to myself, and it's just an open open air staircase, you know. So when anyone's walking by, if they're talking on the phone or anything, I can hear, you know, every word of their conversation. And yeah. I don't know, I'm just trying to cover it up, maybe put a buffer there, so All right. the sound doesn't get down. All right, forget about this. We're not going to uh, bring the mountain to Mohammed here. You can't block out the world. You got to block out your ears. You got to right. get yourself in some industrial strength ears, ear protection. I I did I molded my own. I did it. They they have a really? kit. It's not bad. Do you cast it in your head? Yeah, yeah. Really? Mm-hmm. That's kind of nice. Yeah, it's just like what I'm doing with my new independent film. Huh? <laughs> got Meryl Streep playing the lead. <laughs> <laughs> cast it in my head. Who's playing? Who's playing you? Oh man, it's. I'll uh, do it. It's that uh, kid from The Hangover, the good-looking one. No, Clooney, Bradley Cooper. Man. Come on, it's Bradley Clooney. Cooper's playing me. Oh. Uh, no, I want a younger one. I want me to be younger. <laughs> uh, so, Corey, here's what you do. You go online, and I think for like 12 or 13 bucks, everyone should do this. You get this earplug stuff, and it's a two-part system. Now, there's an expensive version where you make a mold, you send it into a lab, and they send you back the impressions. But there's a cheaper one, which I never understood. I did both for, for racing because I have a couple cars that are pretty loud. But you take this stuff, and it's like part A and part B. It's like epoxy. It's uh, resin and catalyst. And once you start mixing it together, it will do nothing. It will feel like taffy on a hot day, A and B, for 2,000 years. But if you put it together, you have nine minutes to work with it before it turns into into a Super Bowl. And what you do is you do it up, and it just becomes like, uh, it's like silly putty, and you mash it into your ears. You just fucking mash it. With your fingers, or is there an applicator? No, just you just literally like use it into your finger. A ball and you smash it I mean, with you your make finger. it into yeah. two sides, like eh, let's say it took three, four pieces of chewing gum, chew it up, made into a ball, shove it in ears. I made a butt plug out of what <laughs> I had left over. Because why not? I'm sitting there with the material. Duh. I that always, was a gimme. How many orifices do I have to fill? Matt helped out on that one. Nine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just a quick safety Boom. tip. If you're going the butt plug route. Uh, but go ahead and put shave. A, put a shave and put a string in there first, <laughs> so you can get it out. I had uh, a little difficulty. Yeah. Right. Wait. So they it worked really well. Which one worked better? The one you sent away for, or the one A the, and B the, you the, did the, yourself? The one I, the one I sent away for is like 150 bucks. It had to go to some lab in Texas, and uh, it worked pretty good. This one works pretty good too. So you make the mold and then you leave it in your ear for you know eight minutes, and then it hardens, and then you pop it out. And uh, then you have some, in, like, custom-made industrial. I mean, it's like, you remember when we played football? 
when you have a mouthpiece and you yeah. just put it in, it's not for your mouth. You heat it up, you put it in your mouth, you bite down on it. Now it's made for you. And that's what these earplugs are. So do that. Get a nice eye shade and uh, have fun sawing the logs. Huh. Done and done. Uh, All right. I told uh, <laughs> I had a little condescending uh, conversation with uh, Matt the Porcelain Punisher. What? Uh-oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had the two blue ear things. And I put them in my ears, and then I pulled them out. And um, I said, uh, now I'm going to write an R on the right side so I know which one is which. What do you think I'm going to write on the left side? And he said, an L. And I said, no, nothing. Nothing, yeah. Because why why would you? That'll be the one that's not the right side. I don't have a third ear. As long as I don't get the butt plug mixed up, <laughs> I'll be fine. But they Could all look alike. That. That's right. All right. Uh, thank you uh, so much for your uh, home improvement phone calls. Ray, What do you, you're like tweeting and stuff now, right? Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. Podcast, Ace on the House, by the way. With, yeah, uh, I do. Mr. Ray. Everyone loves that show. Saturday on uh, iTunes, and uh, you can get it at the Adam Kroll app and uh, Ace on the House. Dot com, or as my dad would call it, Ace on the Roof. And because uh, <laughs> why would he get anything right? It's technically right. That's true. All right. Little outro. It's Ace on the House. Hey, thanks to MaximumStyle.com. Use the code ADAM, A-D-A-M, for additional savings. And thank you for listening. All right. What we should do is take a quick break. Eli Roth is out there. I haven't spoke to him in a little while. Very good guy. Excited about that. And, uh, oh, by the way, boom. Do we have uh, the boom ringtone? Do we? It's available. Let's hear it. Whoa. Boom. <laughs> That's that? good. Uh, that like that. is a great alert for any text that comes uh -huh. through. Boom. <laughs> you can uh, search uh, Porcelain Punisher in the uh, iTunes ringtone store. So, boom. You just punch in <laughs> Porcelain Punisher. All right. Go to iTunes. Punch in uh, Porcelain Punisher. Boom. <laughs> and uh, there you go. Pick up that ringtone. I kind of like that. I like it, too. All right, quick break. Back with Eli Roth next. Boom. Eli Roth in studio. Good to see you, as usual, Eli. A uh, pleasure, as always. Uh, glad to be back. Eli, um, probably most noted for a hostile. Well, actually, The Bear Jew, which Inglorious Bastards. I love that movie. Thanks, By the man. way, I just love that goddamn movie. It was it was truly it was like the Jewish wet dream to go to yeah. Germany and shoot Hitler and bash in Nazis with a baseball yeah. bat. It was weird how much I had spent a part of my life actually fantasizing about doing those things and to get them act them out. And what I found was the German actors had the same fantasy. Like when you were bashing the guy's head in, that mm -hmm. actor was like, "Yeah, we get to kill these guys." And even the guys playing Goebbels or Hitler were like. They had had the fantasy, like having grown up with this, of just killing them. So it was this weirdly joyous experience for everyone. When we were filming the most violent scenes. Well, it did. I mean, I, I, I feel like it's what sane Americans should feel about, like the Grand Wizard of the Klan and stuff like that. Like, come on, you're fucking things up for me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like Germany. Right. Like you're trying to be quietly racist. I'm and no, so no, no, no. I'm, I'm bigging it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh no, I'm setting my ways. Yes. I'm set in my ways. That's right. That's different. And they're fucking it up for you. Yeah, I'm I'm barely bigoted. Yeah. And all of a sudden, we're getting painted as a racist. Yeah. You're old school. I'm old school. <laughs> set in yeah. my ways. Aftershock is the name of the uh, new movie. It is out uh, May 10th. And uh, again, uh, Hostel, um, well, what can you say? Uh, cost uh, four million bucks to uh, make and made over 150 million to date. It did well. It Jesus did really well. Christ. It was kind of a shock because at the time there were there hadn't really been that level of violence in movies. Mm -hmm. But at the, at the time it was the, sort of the Bush Cheney uh, Rumsfeld era of mm -hmm. American imperialism, and you know I I kind of I like to make movies about stuff that I find very disturbing, and certainly Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld at the time I found very freaky. And and you did this one on your own, like this independent. Is this is like you, I have an idea, I'm going to write it, I'm going to produce it, I'm going to direct Very it. Very similar to, by the way, I again want to compliment you on your performance in The Hammer. The Hammer, if wow. people have not seen that movie, obviously you know that Adam can box, and you know that he's funny, 
But your dramatic acting in that movie was incredible. It was wow. such an enjoyable experience to see that movie. And I feel like if that movie came out now or had like a re-release now with VOD and iTunes, there's a whole new way to give indie movies a fighting chance against the Iron Man 3s, which is exactly how we're releasing Aftershock, which is a low-budget movie that we mm -hmm. shot independently in Chile. But it'll come out in 100 theaters, but also it'll be on your Time Warner cable. It'll be on iTunes. It's everywhere. Basically, you can just you can just buy the movie and watch it in your house or see it in the theaters. But these movies like Bachelorette and Arbitrage, there are a lot of movies that are getting massive audiences because people are you know people have it right there in their homes. Yeah. Well, a uh, dollar short and a day late as uh, per usual. But don't worry, I'll do another movie one of these days. <laughs> I'm uh, actually going to go shoot a little uh, Kickstarter type video with the great Brian Cranston uh, tomorrow. So uh, those kicks, look by the way, that. how about um, what's his name? Zach Braff just raised two million, two million dollars. No, this new this new Kickstarter thing is changing everything. I've actually thought about funding movies this way because you don't have to pay back any investors. And then basically whatever the release plan is, like you own the movie 100 percent and you have nothing to lose. You don't have to pay anybody back. Well, how did you what was the budget for this one? Aftershock we did for around two million and I got the money from some doctors in Buffalo. Now, they put up the money. But then what I do is I pre-sell different territories like we pre-sell England for half a million dollars and you pre-sell Germany for 200,000 mm -hmm. and they buy it on my name and on the script and right. on the premise. And I say, OK, it's a horror thriller. It's earthquake. Uh, sometimes you have to shoot a little teaser and sometimes territories will wait and then we'll cut like a sizzle reel of like five or ten minutes and then they'll go, okay, here's 400,000. And that's right. what we did. And basically you pay for the movie so that you hold back the U.S. The movie's completely paid for. And then we made a deal uh, with Dimension to release the film this way. I saw. And you shot how many how many days? How it long was, was this It shoot? was 40 days. But what's cool now is that my, this is my friend Nicolas Lopez, who he lived through the earthquake in Chile. We, I remember we were, we were talking about how, how can we do, shoot a movie in Chile? He's been shooting a lot of films there. And he's like, dude, I shot my last feature on a Canon 7D, and I put it in theaters, and nobody knew that I shot it on a Canon. Mm -hmm. People thought I shot it on a 35-millimeter film. And right. I'm like, there's no fucking way you can do that, dude. And I went down there, and we did tests, and he's like, put a really nice lens on a 7D or a 5D, and if you light it right, it looks like 35 millimeter. So we just we shot the entire movie on SLR cameras. Well, not only for for those who are are interested, it's not only the film. Uh, obviously, it's the processing, but the editing and all the stuff is just so much faster. I mean, you you can see what you're shooting, you can play it back, you can you edit as you it, go. The the camera literally cost 2,500 dollars, which you couldn't even do two years ago, and the software and the the way you can edit it now on your computer, and they're giving away DaVinci Color Correction, which used to be like so expensive, they give the software for free. Mm -hmm. So you can now, if you want to buy the hardware, that's how they make their money. So things like Avid, Final Cut, the sound mixing, all that stuff that used to be so expensive is so cheap now. And we're just basically putting a lot of stuff into building the sets and the production value. But it's sort of like the, what it used to cost to make an independent film, the cost has come down it's it's incredible now. Well, I have mixed feelings about this. It's the same way I feel about like podcasting. Like <laughs> anybody can have their own radio station now and anyone can shoot their own film and anyone can cut their own CD or make their own music or record their own music or whatever. And uh, and that's great if you're Eli Roth, but it's not great if you suck like 99% of people do at their attempts at art. So well, it's going to mean a flood of shit, too, right? But that's the history. But it's also exciting because it makes everyone step their game up. It's sometimes in that flood of shit, you get like one diamond that one floats brilliant out. Turd. One I mean, brilliant turd. One brilliant one. dust rise to the top, right? Well, they, yeah, cream. I mean, they say that the like, cream rises to the top. But the, the truth is, if you think about it, think of how long the electric guitar has been around. But then there comes John Lennon or Jimi Hendrix or, right. or, you know, one of these people that understands or you know Kurt Cobain that just does it in a completely different way I think it's great I mean it used to be I think we're getting a lot better movies I mean when I saw an independent movie years ago it was so expensive to get the film and the cameras a lot of the movies just sucked yeah there were these self-important pieces of shit and now the fact that we can take our cameras like when we shot the earthquake sequence we were really smashing things we took the same cameras that we're using in this room now like that like the cannons like that and we put them on a remote control helicopter right. and we flew it through the city and, and suddenly you put it through a little stabilizing software it looks like spider-man level shots so yeah it's exciting I, I think it's really cool the uh chile i don't know what it was over there seven point whatever maybe more but it's 8.8 that's pretty massive. They got beat by Japan. It was like it was like eight point eight, and then I think Japan was eight point nine. But yeah, it was crazy. 
Uh, and also, like I always tell people, because I used to do earthquake rehab, unreinforced concrete, bad news in uh, earthquake country. You need a bunch of plywood and a bunch of two-by-fours, you'll be fine. Well, you know, the, the thing with the earthquake was it hit during the summer at 3.30 in the morning, and a lot of people were in the club. So they were just, like, out. And, you know, they go all night in Chile. They go to, like, 6 in the morning. It's very modern. It's very, it actually looks very similar to L.A. in Santiago. Um, but what happened was everyone, you know, the clubs just started crashing down. There's a cast member. Her friend got both his hands cut off. And oh. then everyone was looking for the hands. But then they were worried the club was going to collapse. And they found one. And then someone took one. Like, oh. crazy. And then the... the, the someone pr- took one? Yeah. They put it in a bag. And then the Whoa. bag got taken. They couldn't find the hand. Wow. And then you couldn't call the police. You couldn't call the fire. The cell phones went out. And my friend, Nicholas, who I wrote it with, he, he picked up his landline to call his mother and realized he didn't know his own mother's phone number because it was all on his cell phone. Right. Everything's in the iPhone. Then the prisons broke open. Ooh. And so prisoners were, were getting out. And then what happened was the tsunami warnings came in. The tsunami sirens went off. So everyone started fucking freaking out and running for the hills. And Chile and Japan communicate to see they're on like the same, I guess, line of mm-hmm. whether a tsunami's going to hit. And Japan's like, it doesn't look like it's going to hit. And then four hours at like five in the morning when people went back to their beds and went to sleep, boom, like tsunami came and wiped out 2,000 people. So the, like the stories that he told me of what happened that night were like, okay, let's not make the oscar version of this let's do this like as you know kind of an exciting genre thriller but the stories of what he told me were so were fucking incredible and the club where we filmed the earthquake like where the ceiling collapsing speakers falling he he went through the security camera footage and we basically recreated what he saw like there was one guy that was cr- the speakers fell and just crushed him to death because people were running for the exits right they were climbing over the speakers and crushed the guy but then they got crushed in the doorway it was and and everyone was drunk, and it was the last weekend of summer, so everyone's in like high heels and skirts, and it was it was crazy filming it. And what were the chicks wearing? The chicks <laughs> were wearing thongs, and they looked really hot in blood. Uh, the did you see the movie Earthquake? I love Earthquake, of course. I uh, I love Earthquake too. You got to watch that movie. I've never seen Earthquake. It's 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 Irwin Allen, who I guess did Poseidon yeah, Adventure, did, yeah, yeah. did all the great disasters. Towering disaster Inferno. Movies. It's like, not an adventure was a really good movie. It, it was always the same things. Like somewhere a- around Act One, the engineer would come in or the architect, and we'd go, "Those girders need to be supported." And they'd go, "Please, we're saving money here. Now get out of here." Exactly. And so it's like, and it's like, okay, well, but, I guess we know what's going to happen. But he also would. Oh, what the genius of Ern Allen is, he would get basically every great actor. It was the '70s, and he would get every Academy Award winning actor from 1936. Right, be like Henry Fonda, Tyrone Power, John Gilgood, Joan Fontaine. They'd be right. like, "What?" But Agnes Moore. They're like, they're like 78 years old. In these movies, but and then the bottom of the poster would have like twenty five faces of all these Oscar winners. Fine. People were like, "Oh, this must be good." All these people are in it. They get, for one scene, they get killed. Fine. It was sort of he was. It really. It's like it's sort of like what the Love Boat did later on. They went literally. <laughs> let's find washed up actors, literally washed up, and we'll throw them on our boat. Throw them on our boat. We'll and it was this crazy, just cavalcade of stars. Joan Blondell, you know, yeah, like, but people, but you, stars, people your parents had heard of, but you well, that's never heard of. Be like, what's well, a good movie? Joan Blondell's in it, exactly. <laughs> that's find, right. You find the poster of Towering Inferno, because yeah. that one had Steve McQueen, OJ, yep. was in that bad boy, too, but then it, it'd be like um, Red Buttons, or, or it'd be like- <laughs> Mickey Rooney. Mickey Rooney, crazy, oh- Oh. Was an airport like that too? Fred, Dean, Dean Martin was an Fred airport. Fred Astaire, ah, yeah. yeah, would be in this. Like, so the, you get this like crazy. Just uh, I've heard of him, heard of him, heard of him. Know her, know her. Wanted to fuck her when I was in junior high. Like it was just like a nonstop. Yeah, and then you just put them all in a building that caught on fire, and they just light them on fire. And then what? You know, we actually wanted to do Irwin Allen style. Paul Newman. Yeah, we we wanted to do Irwin Allen. So what they away. did back then was they really destroyed shit, and that's one of the nice things about shooting in Chile is. <laughs> Nicholas and I, we want to start what we call things. You got it. We wanted to call it Chile Wood, where it's like there's sort of the rules are so much more lax about safety mm-hmm. that we could. I remember we we're shooting the club scene. We we're dropping a huge, like 20 foot. You would have loved the construction of it. Piece mm-hmm. of plaster in the floor, and so we had all these like girls in mini skirts and heels running across and rehearsing it. And I said to the to Nico, the director, I was like, look at all, the- I didn't know there were so many stunt girls. He's like, ah, ha, ha, gringo stunt <laughs> girls. <laughs> right. and, and literally, they were just Did extras. you say drunk, my friend? And, and there were certain things like, 
a lot of Santiago is still destroyed from the earthquake. So there's a scene where I'm in the cemetery and a huge piece of concrete falls on me and I'm like trapped and they can't move and we don't know what to do. And I looked over and there were all these skeletons and broken open tombs. And I said, I was like, man, the art department's amazing. They like I put all these skeletons and he's like, dude, they just unlocked this for us. This has been closed since the earthquake. I'm like, what? Wow. He's like, we didn't dress anything. We literally oh, put stuff the, just like popped open and fell apart and it, stuff. We walked through the graveyards and like the whole thing shook and they don't bury them in the ground. They stack them upward like mm-hmm. filing cabinets or some sure. like Raiders of the Lost Ark stuff. Closer to God. So you got so they all broke open. So they're just bones and crack tombs and you know the aftershocks. They couldn't even repair it. So they closed it down. We're like, can you open it for us and let us shoot there? And they did. Which what, was crazy. What is, uh, find me, uh, by the way, uh, Earthquake, because uh, find me some more real celebrities in there. Uh, Tarantino, insane, not in a bad way, but just a crazy dude. You know, Quentin, there's definitely the, like, interview Quentin persona, where, which, like, any of us, I mean, I guess after you've done it for a while, you're sort of relaxed, but um, there's the I'm excited talking about movies, Quentin. But Quentin's a very normal dude. I mean, he's brilliant. Like, like there, there's certain people that you meet and you're like, that guy's a genius at comedy, that person's a genius at this. Quentin, like, when you actually get in a conversation with him and you start talking about his knowledge of history, like, like even the card game in Inglorious Bastards, mm-hmm. Polo Negri and Female Sergeant Beethoven, he was like, well, yeah, actually, Polo Negri went, went undercover and Frau von Hammersmark is a nod to her character. Like, his knowledge of American history world history and European history is truly astounding. And that's all he does is he sits and reads books. I mean, people think he's just like a nerd watching movies, but that guy sits and reads more than anyone I know, and he just absorbs it all. Like, he has that, he has a mind like a novel. I love the fact that he is so confident in his writing and his performers that he lets those scenes just breathe. And if he... If there was anybody who had any creative say over him, they would have been, you take that scene with the dairy farmer. It's coming in at 21 minutes. I need that thing at about seven to nine minutes. We need to start whacking. Get- Quentin, these guys play cards forever. Yeah, like they just, but what people don't realize is that is, there's this part of life where we all want to just hustle right past the foreplay. Like that's what you want to do. You want to get we want right into fucking and sucking. But- the fucking and sucking is a lot better when there's some when heavy there's petting up. going yeah. on. When that as much up. as we don't want to admit it. We don't want to admit it, and we want to just blow past it, pardon the pun. But Tarantino realizes the longer those two just sit in that farmhouse and share a pipe and some milk, the more tension. And so by the time it comes to the scene where you see the people under the floorboards and that, you're, the, the, you've... That pussy is so wet at that point, it's going to explode. Well, the, I, think I just put that on a the way, there. That's an excellent analogy, and Quentin would love that analogy, by the way. He would, uh-huh. he would perfectly love to hear that. It's like the difference in most movies, I guess, if you're going to do it in some sort of game, and it's like watching someone play pinball. It's like right. you walk, go to the movies, it's like ding, 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 explosion. And Quentin's like watching a master yeah. chess player, yes. and they do one move, and then what are they going to do? And it's the building up. And the and what and what's great about him, Quentin, I remember when he wrote Bastards by Hand, and it was coming off of Death Proof. And instead of making a movie that was safe, like a James Bond movie or anything he could have done, he was like, no, I'm going to do it two thirds in another language in five chapters and kill it. Like, it's just his own thing in his own head. He said, I'm going to write it by hand and I'm going to take my typewriter. He can't really type. He's like, I'm going to take my typewriter from Pulp Fiction, Mm -hmm. where you still need the ribbon. Like, he bought up all the old ribbon because you can't find the Mm -hmm. old Smith Corona ribbon anymore. I'm going to fucking type this script. It's 200 pages. I'm going to type every single word of it. And I'm going to force myself, if this ain't fucking Shakespeare, I'm taking it out. And somehow the fact that it took him so long to write the word the, Mm -hmm. he's like, this better matter. And so when he's writing it, he's got his understanding. And and that's what's so like, I remember when he read me those scenes, like he invited me to his house to have dinner. And he's like, hey, I got the first 20 pages of Bastards. And I read that farmhouse scene. And I was like, if this was performed on a stage, you'd have a Pulitzer Prize in your hand. Like, Like that whole analogy with the rat. Right, you know, it's just like would you really give a rat a saucer of milk? Like, it's, right. every, it's like it's so good. It's, it's so engaging. So, it's so engaging. And then he casts. He said he's not making the movie unless he cast Christo- unless he found Londa, and then he found Christoph Waltz. That it, guy 
came in here to do the podcast and I said, you're, you're getting an Oscar. And he was, he's such a sweet, you probably yeah. know him well. The best. The gentle, you know, it's like you, you do, when you meet Christoph Waltz, you go, oh, this is why Europeans are better th- than we are <laughs> so, to a certain extent. Like you realize if that guy was from Jersey, he'd yeah. be talking about himself in the third person and introducing you to his lady friends and wearing a big fucking Italian horn necklace or something. That he's like the just gentle, con- con- the genial, sweet. sweet, sweet guy. And during during the making of the movie, he's not reading any. He's like only reading the script. He's not watching movies. He's not reading books. He's not like. I mean, he's older, but it, it's also at. You know, for this guy, imagine you're in your fifties and you had gone to New York in your twenties. And it didn't work out. And now you're working consistently, but just doing kind of like average German TV stuff, doing the best you can. And then you get this part and suddenly you have an Oscar and two Oscars in a row. And then you see him in Django and you're like, he's he's, he's so good. And well, so that's why, that's why I think and I, I tell people all the time, I really think it's even more about the material than it is about the actor. If Quentin Tarantino is never born, Christoph Waltz is doing, you know, local whatever in in Strudeldorf and you know he's doing the equivalent to small wonder and Strudeldorf <laughs> or make room for daddy or some bullshit and he's doing the best he can do with the material that's being provided to him but the p- material's being written by hack and he's only going to be able I to feel like be so good. Strudeldorf small wonder would actually be a show that I, <laughs> I would, would definitely have loved. watch. I would definitely watch the making of Strudeldorf and small wonder. Christoph, that material they play in Strudeldorf but it'll never play in Berlin. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Maybe like a small Hitler, like a small Hitler robot. Right. I, would, yeah. I would watch a show about I, I So then the guy who can, is a master baker, Christoph Waltz, all of a sudden gets the kitchen and the ingredients. And that's and the, now look the fuck out, world. And, and that's what Quentin said. Quentin's like, this is actually the best part I've written with probably the best actor I've ever worked with. And, conf- and, and, and Quentin's at a point in his career where he's like, this is what my dialogue is. You know, if you, it's so funny to think back now that there was this whole thing he had to shake of Quentin just steals from other movies. And you're like, no, he doesn't. Like, he's a genius. People go, no, he stole this line from this movie. And this. Like, that's what the other guys that worked at the video store would all kind of say around right. interviews. And it's like, he's, it's like, it's so, it's ridiculous to think of that now. And I watched it just come out of his brain to his paper. And it's really like, he's truly a genius. Yeah, he's, he is essentially competing with himself. When it comes to making movies there's, now, there's no, there's, there's, there's no writer at his level. Like you watch the stuff that's in Django and that scene yes. with friends, you know, phrenology right. and those dinner scenes. It's not even about the music or being cool. Like people are watching this going, there just isn't anyone of this. At, like there just isn't anyone writing at that level. It well, there's, isn't. there's, there's nothing. The, the writing at its worst is like when now you take like uh Fast and Furious. <laughs> okay. I'm with you. Are you with me? And I will be seeing the sixth installment. But you take Fast and Furious and you go, uh, uh-oh, uh, here comes Vin Diesel's character and he's going back to his house. And he comes walking in and his sister, Mia, comes up and goes, what are you doing back here? The feds are staked out all over the place. They're watching this place like a hawk. And he goes, don't worry about it. And <laughs> and then they move on. I cut to scene in kitchen. And it's like, I'm watching a movie going, all right, the feds have staked out the house. You're walking up the front driveway. You have a dilemma. It got solved by the character saying, don't worry about it. Not not satisfied. I've not checked that box as a moviegoer. And yet you don't go see Fast and Furious for the plot turns. You see them for the plot Right, but turns. I, still f- I still find that it's super lazy. There's no question. Super lazy. The- and and when, when Tarantino is is has Christoph Waltz and Jamie Foxx and they're sitting in the saloon and he tells that guy to go get the marshal and then you're sitting there going, how the fuck, fuck is he going to get out of how this gonna one? How are they going to get out of this one? getting out of this one? And he one? just walks out in the street and everyone's got the guns fixed on him and everything. <laughs> so and you're good. like, how is he ever going to get out of this? And then it's he completely just, satisfying. Like you just, go, all right, that makes total sense to me. You don't go, oh, come on, bullshit. They never. No, you go, there you go. Well, it's, he did it. It's so, I know. And that's what's so satisfying is to watch Christoph Waltz just run circles around everybody. To wa- It's so enjoyable to watch Kristoff be the smartest one in the room mm-hmm. and know that he's got something up his sleeve and you don't know what's coming. And Quentin's kind of like that. Like, you know 
there's going to be some sort of payoff coming. And even in Django, when you think they're getting away and he's going to do it, and then suddenly he gets like, Kristoff is shot, he's shackled, she's, it's like, whoa, how the fuck's he going to get out of a mine? Right. Like, how's Django going to get out of this? And then to watch Django pick up with it, it's just, it's so supreme. And people go, oh, it's the gun violence. It's, it's, no, it's because you're watching, you're with that character fantasizing about how you'd get out of it. And whatever Quentin writes, it's so, it's like, oh, God. It's just so the most, good. the most interesting material out there. And by there. the way, can I just say, it's fucking hard for him. Like, I've watched the guy close when he's writing and yeah he writes scenes like any of us like you could sit down do you want to write a joke i'm sure you could like you you want something about that mug yeah you could do it but to come up with that a material that's like that's the joke you're remembered for it's fucking hard and like and quentin does that like i've watched him he never what's so admirable about him is that he never takes the easy way out in any movie in any situation anything he's writing it's never lazy writing like he's so tough on himself and like squeezes that part of his brain and he tells me he's like the fucking scariest thing is looking at the blank canvas the looking at an empty page and that's why he doesn't type he got me handwriting he's like my pen is my antenna to god man you can't fucking write poetry on a computer like you gotta write longhand so i started writing longhand. oh interesting i mean he's like it's just you're more connected to it you every word counts you're thinking about it you're in it like he's like you're disconnected there's a level of disconnect with me i have a question for you eli about your writing i've heard you say i think in interviews and podcasts and things that the horror in your movies is um like a parable or sort of of an exploration of things that of different feelings or I don't know if you'd use the word wish fulfillment but that it's symbolic so I'm just wondering in Aftershock like what to you what is it about well that Aftershock um, was really about the collapse of society and the fragility of what we have like here we are we're in a podcast we're all behaving I'm being polite you're being nice we're being cool we have friends come we want the show to look good but then like something goes terribly wrong like they're shaking and you have to grab someone's arm or like do i save you or you it's it's these moral choices and you don't know who would you save of us who would you say like um well i don't want to say you in front of adam but adam that's got Um, names on the (laughs) well not really on the building but at least on the deed yeah um but it's it's that it's all about moral choices so we're thinking of situations because when nico told me about it he's like he called his girlfriend and she's like, I'm okay, but oh shit, the sirens are off. There's a tsunami. Went, and he's like, wow, what the fuck do I, do I go find her after and she's an hour and a half? Well, you can't do it. But people ran into situations where like the, the example for us was you're running by a building and you hear a crying baby inside and it's an earthquake. And do you run in and save that baby? But every five seconds there's aftershocks where literally buildings are collapsing. What do you do? So in each situation, we wanted to give the characters that moral choice of what do you do. And in most cases, the thing they choose to do to preserve themselves often goes turns horribly wrong, but it's also the same choice the audience would have made. So we don't want to make anyone look like a bad guy for doing it, but it's like that's, you know, it's, it's this fear of being alone. Who do you rely on yourself? But I'm, I'm fascinated by the fragility of society. I mean, look at Katrina when things fall apart. And, and also... I think even... Immediately after 9-11, people felt that. I mean, people like the, the way how our life is going. And I also love, to me, it was about how the, the minutia, the minor problems in your life that you let grow to be of such great importance really don't mean fucking shit. And the earthquake just shakes it up and puts it in perspective. So in the movie, we really, like my character plays a guy who's recently divorced and is totally out of touch with dating and meets his friends in Chile and we're trying to like go to clubs and fuck girls and I can't connect with any girls because I have no game. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like, a, And then he meets this girl who's a model who has like a three-year-old daughter and they connect on the parent level, but he can't quite close the deal. And then another guy moves and it's all this minor stuff and the next thing in your your friend's ha- hands are cut off and you got to get him to a hospital or he's going to bleed to death but then by then your other friend is hurt but like they're slowing down the group and then these guys that broke out of the prison are trying to get you in there they want to rape the girls but you got to protect the girls but you want to protect yourself it's like all about basically raising the stakes and the moral choices well and also it's a juxtaposition where one minute you're just partying your ass off in a club and the next minute you're just running for your life, which, which is the difference between, I don't know, kicking back and watching TV in your underwear and running for your life, which is a juxtaposition, but not as good as dancing your ass off and, and not as big a chasm between dancing your ass off and running for your fucking life. But, 
Yes. No, I was going to say, but that's, you know, Hitchcock talked about the birds symbolized how about the randomness of life, how these fucking like you're fine one day and then these things just come and attack you. And talking to everyone that lived through that earthquake, they talked about how exactly that, like you're out with your friends, you're at a club, you're having fun, you're and the next thing you're literally running through plate glass windows. And he, he told me that he, a guy, a girl he knows was on a first date with a guy. And wow. they went up to like make out point to look at the city and the fucking earthquake hit and a huge rock dropped on the car and the guy was paralyzed. Wow. And this girl is on a first date with this guy and she's in a car and the guy's like fully paralyzed but alive. She had to take him out of the car, put him in the back seat while there's aftershock, while they're shaking, and drive down the hill. And he had a stick shift car, and she didn't know how to drive sticks, so the car's bucking. Like, And that was like one of thousands of stories that happened to people. And that's just the sad, freaky part of life. That's what scares me. I'll tell you what he should do. He should get her one dozen rainbow <laughs> roses for just nineteen ninety nine from Pro Flowers. Smooth. That's what they called me in high school. for driving me down the hill. That's right. You know what? He should step it up. He should get the chocolates and the premium pink vase, oh, and definitely just, go for the add-on package. Yeah, definitely. It's only twenty nine ninety eight, fifty percent off. Everybody, Pro Flowers recently awarded the highest customer satisfaction by JD Power and Associates. And uh, again, Mother's Day right around the corner. He should get his mom something nice too, because you know, seeing your son in that wheelchair, it's got to take a lot out of her. And the only way to get this amazing deal is to go to proflowers.com, click on the microphone in the top right corner, and type in ACE. That's proflowers.com, and uh, hit the microphone. Promo code ACE, order now, expires very soon. All right, Eli, we're going to do a little news. You want to hang in and uh, crack wise? Love to. Love you, baby. With Allison Rosen. She'll read some news from her iPad. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. It's Allison. Allison And when it's time to wrap it up She'll sign it off with zip it cut It's Allison Allison So Adam, I think you'll be happy to hear The FDA has approved the morning after pill Without prescription oh, good. For people who are 15 uh, years of age or older And they do require age They so require proof of age now We can have sex with I'm did I misunderstand her We can have sex with 15 year olds That's what I'm now. hearing Because that's what I got out of that Yeah no yes. questions asked. The FDA yeah. approved that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Don't Tired of coming that. on those 15-year-old tits? Step it up. This took a different turn than I was expecting. Huh? Anyway, yeah. Mm. So, yeah, they finally have. Now, it's just plan B one step, which mm-hmm. is a, because they decided that the study showed or whatever that 15 year olds could comprehend how to use one step whereas some of the other morning after pills are a little bit too complicated so those you still have to be 17 and older well, what I'm wondering though is hmm. let's say a 13 year old gets pregnant or a 14 year old oh hey that's weird I'm not going there <laughs> I start at 15 like they do in Chile mm-hmm. there but, they have I mean, the plan, younger plan you are. B dubstep that's like what the kids are <laughs> into dubstep oh. mm-hmm. yeah I know I'm I'm in I I, mm-hmm. uh, some minority here, probably, but the, the younger you are, you, the more access you sh- access you should have. I think. Well, look, it, it, we don't treat things, uh, we don't address things. It's it's sort of like look, it's like clean needles. Like you know, I remember back in the eighties, AIDS was basically a gay thing, and then it was getting spread around because junkies were getting the needles, and they were sharing the needles, and then someone would go, look, let's provide clean needles so the junkies don't get the AIDS spread, and so it doesn't make its way into the heterosexual Mm -hmm. community and drug community and so on and so forth. And then someone would always go, I don't like the idea of giving these junkies free syringes. And I'd always think, like, I don't like it either. But let's be realistic. Yeah. They're doing it, and we don't want What's worse, the free syringes or AIDS running rampant in the heterosexual community and the drug IV drug using community? So this is worse. So I don't like the idea of like thinking of my daughter at 13 taking the morning after pill. I don't like that idea. But let's also be realistic. We don't want a bunch of unwanted kids running around. It's ironic to me, always has been because Dr. Drew and I have been talking about this for 14, 15 years since it came out, the groups that claim to hate abortion are the first ones that are trying to shut this shit down, which is insane because if you hated something or somebody hates something, like if you said, look, I hate male pattern baldness, and then someone went, 
good. I got a pill that'll cure that. And you went, get that shit out of my face. You'd go, well, wait a minute. Do you really hate male pattern baldness? Because I'm offering you a pill mm -hmm. that's going to cure it or it's fl or flat tires or cold Hungarian food. Like whatever it is, I can fix this. So wait, if Wait, is there a pill? Yeah, sorry. I, I was an example. Oh. Bad example. Sorry. So there's not a pill? Not uh, Propecia, I think. But I don't mm -hmm. think that. I think it's a little late, late for you. you. The yeah. point is, you hate abortions, right? This pill will significantly significantly no, cut down sex. on abortions. Right. They hate un they People hate basically yeah. well, recreational. They, hate, yeah. they don't like recreational right, sex. Right. And I've been saying for a million and then everyone called it abortion pills and I would Dr. Drew and I would have to explain it's not an abortion pill, but we were yelling well, about that, it in nineteen ninety. That's where they start arguing, we hate abortion, we hate abortion. They're like, no 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 like literally the moment you have sex, like it's upon ejaculation, that's when it starts. Right. So anything from that point on is considered abortion. Yeah, I'm just saying. It's crazy. If you really hate abortion, as at least we sort of de define it in modern society, there's a way to drastically reduce that. Here's a way to do it. It's safe. It's easy. It's cost effective. And you want to. And by the way, the same people that are complaining about the welfare moms and the having to buy your kid lunch and all that kind of stuff, they're all many in the same group we could wipe a lot of that out with this so well, i'm the, for and it the, the people who hate i mean we're also talking about people who are against sex education they're against condoms i mean even if they're going to say that life starts at the moment of i guess w if they're going to say the morning after pill is an abortion pill even though there is something else called the abortion pill then how about just condoms well, the other thing is like if they're going to argue that life begins at conception, I'd like to propose the counter argument that abortion can be extended until they're 60 years old so we could abort some of them. Hey, when you <laughs> learn to program a universal remote, for me, is when life you're begins. Viable, you're a viable human. Yes, you're viable. All right, what Can I else? ask Eli a question mm. real quick? Sure. Speaking of getting noticed or recognized at the uh, grocery store, do you ever get recognized or misrecognized for uh, the guy who plays Spock, Zachary Quinto? I, I actually had a great moment where I was on a date uh, it was one of those those model Ooh, dates. Wow! But the new, it's weird. The, new Star the weird. Star uh, Trek. Well, that's actually two pictures of him. That's, that, uh, I was going to say. Those are two that pictures of Zachary Quinto. Like it doesn't look like Or Eel. is it? Um, we have a crack staff here. And when <laughs> yeah, I say Quinto that, Quinto I mean or Rock. That's impressive. Um, um, yeah, I, that, that happened to me. I was on a date with a girl, and some <laughs> guys like, I just want to come up to you and say, it's like, okay, it's my son's bar mitzvah. Can I have an autograph? Something. Like, of course, it's the Bear Jew. And All then right. he just turns to me and he's like, When's the next Star Trek coming out? And I was like. Next week, <laughs> you ever get the love the girls gone wild series? A Joe Francis, mm -hmm. I wish if yeah, girls came up to me and flashed their tits at me, that's awesome. a recognition I would I would take. I I get fantasize that on digital. about that. Uh, I gotta tell you, I can uh, I I find you more attractive than Joe Francis, although there's a certain magnetism the man has. Oh yeah, of course. undeniably so. But maybe uh, it might be HGH. But I saw you pop up on TMZ the other night, and they just popped up the picture. I think I was skipping my rope. I didn't have the sound up, and I. I thought Joe Francis, but I thought just because they liked the bus of chops and he got a DUI or whatever. But it was you attacked by an octopi. Yeah, I guess you could say attacked or you could say I was snorkeling and the snorkel guide pointed out an octopus and it floated by. And I stupidly reached out to grab it and touched it and thought this is the coolest. I'm literally like having a bonding moment with an octopus. And then um, I didn't realize its mouth was on the underside of its belly. And I was like, oh, wow, it's squirting ink. Mm -hmm. He must be really freaked out at me. And then, um, you know, we got out of the water and I was like profusely bleeding because mm -hmm. I had had like a couple bottles of wine the night before and sliced the tip of my finger. And I was and they were like, you're bleeding. I'm like, no, I'm not. Like, I didn't even feel it. You were you had sliced your finger the night before. No, I drank wine the night before, uh, and then sliced your finger on the, on the octopus. On the, I didn't realize it, but yeah. And then I got out, and, and I was like, and I felt it, and I thought it was squirting ink, but it was actually blood coming out uh, of my finger. And then I got out, and they were, and it was ridiculous. I was like, does this? I, what I want to know is, does this qualify as me having done battle with an octopus? Can I say I fought an octopus? I would say, yeah. I would definitely All say right. yeah. it was. I was fighting. It was an old octopus fighting injury. So it bit you well yeah i mean it was beak. like it wasn't like chomp it was like i was feeling around it went by and the little teeth snagged on it yeah, yeah. I, there's nothing there's nothing greater than the notion of the giant octopus or squid that's doing battle with the whale yeah you, you know what i mean yeah. just visually i would have been Mortal the whale Kombat. 
in this yeah. case. Mm. It was yeah. about the size of my hand. Though. Where were you? It was a baby. This was in Hawaii on the Big Island. Sweet. My first time there. And I had had an attack with sea urchins earlier. In the, and I was like, I'm going to get over my sea urchin phobia. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I was swimming around. I'm like, okay, there's sea urchins. And I'm fine. No problem. There's a little eel. There's a turtle. Oh, little Mr. Octopus. And boom. Oh, yeah. look, Mr. Oster- bit- Octopus, I'm going to put my hand out and touch it. I think well, that was where. It's weird because when I'm in the wild and I see an octopus, naturally I assume he's protecting sunken treasure. So sure. I was just reaching for treasure. If there's sure. one thing I've learned from films. Yeah, they're protecting. If mm-hmm. Where there is an octopus, they are protecting sunken treasure. And I wanted to know if there was gold in maybe <laughs> his belly or where, where's the treasure. Yeah, I sort of miss the, I don't know, feels it's like a lot of movies had the sea monster or at least eels that were protecting, mm-hmm. what was that movie? Popeye. The Blue. <laughs> the Blue Lagoon. No, what was the, uh, The Deep. Yeah. The Deep was a, a movie with Nick Nolte. Okay. And Jacqueline Bissett. Jacqueline Bissett. In a white t-shirt. Who got out with no, no bra, mm-hmm. got out of the water. Very exciting. It's all we had for porn back then. And it was the poster for the deep. It's true. That National aw- Geographic was awesome. Much. And there was a <laughs> ship that sunk with a bunch of drugs or something in it, morphine or something. And there was a giant eel that was protecting the morphine. That's, of course. That's, I know it sounds bizarre, but that's uh, that not story. bizarre at all. Yeah. And uh, uh, Robert Shaw. Mm hmm. Maybe that, you, maybe one of Robert Shaw's last movies. I love that you sometimes struggle to remember your kids' names, and you just nailed the plot of the deep. <laughs> well, a little <laughs> with look, detail. Little uh, douchey and what's his nose over there can get over. It. <laughs> All right, I'll be watching Black Sunday with Robert Shaw. That's right. Continue my Robert That's Shaw right. film festival. And take the uh, Goodyear blimp and run it into the Coliseum <laughs> during the Super Bowl. You got it. <laughs> yeah. You no, know, you don't see treasure chests very often anymore. No. Yeah, yeah, you don't. Like, I, did they is, have wallets back then? I don't know how they moved their booty back then. <laughs> and you had <laughs> to hide chests. it. You had to. You, if you had your treasure, like that was like the bank. That was like safer yeah. than the bank. It's like today's bitcoins. You got to just like sink your treasure <laughs> under the sand, so no one, the government, won't find it. And you get like an octopus, and you're like, look, we have here's a map the deal. With an X. Yeah, there's a lot of maps and a lot of guys threatening guys who had the map, or a lot it's of like, guys. What would happen with the map? First off, if a I was making map. a map, well, they would get torn in half. Yeah. Mm. And you'd have one right. half and, and I'd have the other half. half. And right. only an 11-year-old kid in like Santa Clarita, California could actually decode the map because it right. was found in the grandmother's attic. Mm-hmm. And then you'd have to find a lot of people that could swim with like, you know, blades between their teeth. I've often said that thing where you jump into a body of water off like a suspension bridge and you decide to put the knife in your mouth. Yeah, that's just got to be. Idea. I'd rather put it up my ass. Mm-hmm. I'd rather just I I'd put it in my liver why? before, I, not in the mouth. Yeah, no, you're gonna yeah. wind up like the Joker. Your head, like you're like Mr. Mouth. Your head would literally split right. in half like that. Right, just can't keep his big mouth shut. <laughs> Mr. Mouth was a game. <laughs> See, we are, it's really sad. Mr. Now I'm Mouth, Mr. Mouth, Mr. Mouth. Mr. Mouth. <laughs> yeah, that's what ha- that's what would happen to those people. Would try to Unless you were in like like Island of the Fish People which was retitled as Screamers, where a guy was going for sunken treasure by taking a bunch of people and like keeping them captive and breeding them as mutants to give them gills wow. so they could swim underwater and hold I their brush to find the sunken treasure. About. There was also a chance you would get your foot caught in a giant clam. <laughs> I, I do not want to fuck with a giant clam. There's not. I don't know why there aren't more giant clam deaths in movies. Like Giant clams are the scariest thing to me because that's it. They trap you, and then you just have to wait and be slowly mm-hmm. digested. It's like the sarlacc. Now, yeah. Are they the ones that have the fluted? Yes. Shell. Yeah, they're sort of serrated, and they 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 hang out at the bottom, and at some point they close on your foot, <laughs> and the problem with the slow digestion that's going to take a while, but you run out of air much faster than they then your digest foot turns you. Into a pearl. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there are giant clams. Yeah. I mean, they they, they exist. Like, we're I not just, making that up. I don't know where they we are. We made up a lot of stuff tonight. Right. But we've not made no, up the giant that's clams. True. Mm. All right. What's the next story, baby girl? Well, uh, investigators in Boston obtained DNA from the widow of Tamerlan, mm-hmm. the, you know, mm-hmm. the dead Boston oh, oh, right, right. suspect. Uh-huh. Although, as someone pointed out, I don't know why they're still calling them suspects, because don't we pretty much know it's them, but that's a legal thing. Oh. So they're obtaining DNA from her. Right. She's... Uh, She's American, but she became Muslim. She converted. Well, it's this thing of, uh, we I always say, stupid or liar. Like, they're living in a fucking two-bedroom, you know, 800-square-foot apartment. Your uh, guys who's, you know, declared a holy war 
on America is cooking up a crock pot bomb and you don't know what's going on in the fucking kitchen. Like that's the question. How, yeah. how, how much of that activity? First off, at least I live in a house of 5,000 square feet. I wouldn't even try beating off if someone's home and I'm good at it. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I can do that shit being chased by a Kodiak bear. I won't even try it with someone else in the house. His history is cleared by the time that tissue hits the trash basket. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, now, and uh, if you want to call an old onesie a tissue, then so be it. But the point is this. <laughs> What's his face? <laughs> Got to bu- bust over that memory glass every once in a while. Get a little mop material. Point is this. How does she not know what this guy's cooking up in that fucking kitchen? Like, oh, no, sweet, mm-hmm. and just you're really making Irish stew with ball bearings? Uh, uh, don't worry about yeah. it. Yeah, where's her female intuition? Yeah, yeah. I feel like so you just get a weird sense. You got to know. Well, you got to know. Female DNA was found on a piece of the um, the pressure cooker. So that's kind of like a breakthrough thing. So now they're trying to find out who, well, whose is yeah, this. Yeah, but she's going to know, well, I bought it, but I didn't know what he was planning on doing with it. And then there's yeah. going to be a whole bunch of real unsatisfying answers like well yeah i saw him putting the c4 in there and i saw him doing the thing and i saw him walking out of the house with it and i saw him putting the ball bearings in there but i didn't know what he was gonna do you know or she'll do the thing where i was scared of him well she i mean he had been arrested for domestic violence so she probably was so it's always yeah so then then it's done we're done with her do you is your belief that there's just no way that these people who are close to them didn't know? And there were a lot of negatives in that sentence. The mom, the dad, well, the, the wife. Wasn't the mom, the mom was yeah. like recorded talking about things, right? She was recorded she, as... Saying it's you, America's fault. No, but well, she was recorded about, before okay. that. Right, yeah. It, about, it turns out that... Um, that Russia had listened in on some phone conversations she had. They, they were watching her and they were watching Tamerlan and she and Tamerlan had had a conversation where they, quote, vaguely discussed jihad. I, look, I feel the same way I feel about everything. There's always going to be nut jobs. There's always going to be nut jobs. And then there's going to be the people around them that protect us for them, from them, which is to say this. Cops show up after nut jobs blow things up or crash airplanes into things, or go on shooting sprees. Cops show up and mop up. In the movies, they get there before people start dying, but in real life, they cordon off the area. It's basically a lot of, hey, you can't come in here until the guys come in with the body bags and clean up everybody. It's like somehow they can never do anything until after the thing you're trying to prevent happens. Well, it's like telling a lifeguard to save someone who hasn't drowned yet. (laughs) Powerful imagery. From a giant clam? Giant clam. <laughs> How long are you talking about Allison? Or? Yeah, okay. was that not clear? The point is this. The cops have to hear gunshots going off yeah. or explosions going off, and then they come a-running, yeah. or at least a-jogging, and they that's when they get there. But our first line of defense, so who is our first line? Not the cops, not the firemen, not the FBI, the wives, the mothers, of the fathers of the crazy kids that go on the shooting mm-hmm. sprees, the immediate family. We do this thing. It's like, what about the counselors? How come the school counselor? School counselor doesn't give a fuck. And they're not going to know. There's no and way. They're not going to know. And they have 1,500 mm-hmm. other kids to look after. And if they took every kid that was pouting and listening to the cure and yanked them out of class, there would be no people in the education system. In and they'd get shit canned. Right. They'd be sued. So we have a line of defense. That line of defense is the people who live with the nut job, who's carving the pentagram into their mashed potatoes instead of eating them. You know, the ones that are constantly talking about jihad or the white Aryan movement or how, you know, the government needs to be paid back for what they've done. Like, yeah. yeah, those are the people. Those are the people that live with them. They're married to them sometimes. Sometimes they're parents. Without them then we got nothing because we don't have enough cops. These cops would need crystal balls. They'd need to know what was going to have to be like a good, you know, Denzel Washington movie. Where every, I think every third movie is like a cop who can see nine minutes into the future. It'd be like <laughs> virtuosity. Virtuosity. Wow. Yeah. Thank deep. deep. Yeah, we went deep. So imagine if you could only see nine minutes into the future, though. I think that was a Nick Cage movie. Right? No one. Or was, yeah, that, that was knowing. Yeah. Nick- I was thinking about the Ben Affleck, Uma Thurman one. Oh, jeez, oh, I can't even think Wu of what one. that one was. You're not allowed to think of it. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Your so, brain won't let you. So 
seems how there's not enough cops to prevent nutball either either troubled 26 year old kid who's going for the jihad or fucked up 14 year old for shooting up the columbine or wherever he's going how's a fucking cop supposed to anticipate this and all right so you put a cop at the end of the finish line it's still not going to do anything Mm -hmm. or you put him in columbine he's not going to be able to get to them when they barricade the whatever maybe the body counts go from 12 to 9 but still you can't see this in advance. So moms, dads, paycheck. <laughs> Sorry, it just got typed in here. What did I come with the uh, Uma Thurman movie? Um, so moms, dads, husbands, wives, they need to be held accountable. And we need to shout it from the mountaintop. We need to say, hey, somebody in your family goes on a fucking killing spree. And it's under your roof. And it, they're living at your house. And they're making that bomb in your kitchen. You're fucking getting your feet held to the fire, bitch. And l- spread the word. Like drinking. If someone gets drunk at the house, if a kid gives another kid, the parents of the house are responsible. Even right. if they had nothing to do. If yeah. alcohol is given under your roof, you have to... Unless you're giving alcohol to 15-year-olds because now there's that new FDA approved... <laughs> Well, we, we we have it's like there's there's the awareness out there of like right. don't drink in this house because I'm not going to get fucked for what your friends do. Our our society is set up that way that when a private goes on a killing rampage, the general gets court martialed. Like that guy was under your watch. Why didn't you do something about it or see it coming? And we do this way with, with everything. You know, manager, a restaurant, someone gets drunk, goes get in a car, they sue the restaurant. The manager maybe wasn't even there that night. doesn't matter. We understand that sort of responsibility under your watch, except for, for the most important one, which is killing people while they're living at home. So let's take the parents of all these disasters and all these tragedies and murders and let's take the spouses and let's take all these people and let's take them and fucking flog them in the public square and send a message to everyone which is the next time you see the husband doing something suspicious with the crock pot you fucking drop a dime on his ass or you're gonna get your ass caned thank you well here's something a little lighter uh, a meteorologist on the Weather Channel had mm-hmm. a bad case of hiccups, and, and there's a video that shows it that's uh, going viral right now. And I brought this in because it's, mm. I think, for people who speak all the time into mm-hmm. microphones or on air, it's something that everyone's afraid of. And because Dave Damashek was crowing about his four and a half years of not having hiccups. Mm-hmm. So anyway, we're just, um, unfortunately, the hiccups are kind of, there's, there's too much time in between them. So here's just... Just a Hold few on. of them. Are you guys with me? Remember I said on stage the other night, I don't feel like I see black people sneeze enough. Yes, I remember you said that. You th- no, I think you said you'd <laughs> never seen them sneeze. I just, it's, I feel, I feel it, like they do it not around it's us. It's like squirrel shitting. I understand they do it, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of squirrels, <laughs> but I never see them. They're going to need some proof. They're not going to do it in front of you. There's something going yeah. on. I, I I don't know, you know, arguably. Our black guest did not kind of shit on Adam's point. He didn't go with it. He didn't go with it, but I'm just saying I've seen enough black people. I've hung out with enough black people. Even when they do commercials, when they do those like nasal X commercials and stuff like that with the bee buzzing around. Mm, Interesting. They don't have a lot of black people on those commercials. Right. Maybe they don't get the allergies. I just don't, I don't feel, I ever see like if, if a black guy went, oh man, I got hay fever. Like you'd go, what? We need yeah, to no, watch it's, When it's the ET white dude does it, you go, a right. No, I'm like, I'm a Jew and we've co-opted anything allergy, anything sneezing. Jews. Yeah. Yeah. Made right. Like, we got it. And like. You can, you, you're you going to take sickle like, cell in a few minutes. <laughs> exactly. You're can't this be close. Like, oh, I have asthma and allergies. Where's my inhaler? Like you don't, you don't mm-hmm. rarely hear that. I don't, I, it's, it's weird. And. I don't. I feel like the Jews have co-opted a lot of the allergies and a lot of the fever, hay fevers and things like that, and the pollen counts and stuff like that. As I said to Alonzo Bowden, I don't feel like I've ever had a brother ask me about the pollen count. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I just don't feel like they're sneezing enough. I like to get to the bottom of that. Black people mm. who listen to this show, let us know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like to check into it. I mm-hmm. bet statistically... They don't have as many allergies as Whitey does. And you don't even hear, like, you. they have Wheezy, mm-hmm. and there's Yeezy that are rappers, but you don't have Sneezy. No. Maybe it's because it's a dwarf. And Ronnie. That's like, right. You don't have, like, Sniffly. Mm-hmm. Like, there's, there's no <laughs> rapper name. Also, that Dirty that Sniffly. Actually, yeah, you don't, you don't hear them, like, Sniffly. Mm-hmm. Sneezy, Scratchy, you don't have that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and a cool way to spell, like, Sinus. 
<laughs> right. P.S. Why? Yeah. Yeah. U.S. And Wheezy, when he said Wheezy. They don't even have a guy named Deviant Septum. <laughs> I thought Jefferson's too. I thought Jefferson's too. This is getting They did have Wheezy. Oh, please. Yeah, the Wheezy. No, Listen. Oh, you thought Jefferson. Oh. Hey, you have a huge cock, an incredible vertical leap, and you almost never sneeze. Come on. That's a slap <laughs> in the face? Yeah. I'd take that any day of the week. True. Thank you. Imagine where that vertical would be if they could sneeze at the exact right moment. I mean, like a rocket ship. Big nostrils. Boom. Boosters. So you're coming up under a guy, and some guy just sneezes down on you and gets in your face. <laughs> yeah. That's like Spider-Man. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. Literally, you could With shoot that a kind of vertical. In. Exactly. Yeah. I will bet you this. I've always said this. I, I know all the guys I, I work construction with back in the day. It was never lactose intolerant. There was never any. Peanut. Yeah, allergies. it was never set gluten-free. It was not, not, they couldn't afford it. Yeah. I think the Jews and or uh, Whitey, the soft Whitey, has earned their way to an allergy. I feel, I feel like the brothers, they're too hardy. Like they're too busy working. Like I, 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 think, I think it's almost like the non-Jews decided that their kids had ADD, which mm-hmm. I don't remember anyone I ever met mm-hmm. ever growing up having something called ADD. They were just right. being kids. Right. And now everybody, like the Ritalin, right. it's everywhere. Yeah. It's like an epidemic. All right. I'm going to find some stats on black people sneezing. I'm going to get to the get bottom on of that. this. I'm going to get to the bottom of this. So did you want to hear the hiccups? It's just oh, the yeah. guy hiccuping went, oh, and trying course. to do the weather. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, inside the Beltway for the moment, you're dry, but you get outside the Beltway, really, it's Highway 6 all the way out to Katy, and it is just a mess out there. Expect to be slow down, and there will be some high water spots, especially along the exit and entrance ramps along I-10. Katy's had most of the rain so far. Lightning and thunder, excuse me, has just <laughs> moved off the funny. west southern portions of uh, Waller County, now getting uh, very wet there. 37 lightning strikes here during the past 15 minutes. There's the storm near Attics, which is making it just a mess. Highway 6, where it meets I- I-10 on the West side addicts. Uh, excuse me, I have the hiccups, of course. This would happen right when we have heavy this weather. This goes on for a whole I'll- three minutes. Uh, the hiccuping. Yeah, and then he sort of slows down and takes a deep breath, and then it still, it still continues. The, the hiccup, by the way, is the only thing I can't really fully control. Terrifying. Have you had I, it on air? I had, a, I had an attack recently. It was terrifying, but I found a great cure for hiccups if you're live on the air. Sure. Every time you hiccup, you just throw in a horrible racial slur after and say you have Tourette's. Oh, <laughs> that's awesome. I can work that in with my black people sneezing thing. Exactly. I had a moment, I don't know why, speaking of controlling things, but um, I had this moment today, and you guys didn't tell me if it could get any worse than this. So I'm sitting with our friend uh, Kevin Hench. We love the Hench. We love the Hench, man. And we're writing our next movie script together. And Hench is just one of these guys where he's he's on hiatus from his TV show, Last Man Standing. And uh, he's ready to go whenever I'm ready to go. So we just pick our little, he says, what's your schedule like? I go, I can do breakfast or I can do lunch or I can do whatever. So I had to get up early this morning and do some radio. And I got up this morning, I did some radio, and I figured I'm going to be done at like 7.45, Hench dropping his kid off at school. I said, I can meet you at the restaurant at like at the diner at like 8.45 this morning. We can, we can knock out a couple pages on the script. So we do it, but I realize, as I've said all the time, my bowel clock has been thrown off. Because mm-hmm. instead of doing what I'm normally doing, which is holding a cup of coffee at 9 o'clock at my house and putzing around in my bathroom, I'm diner. now in a diner and I'm on my fourth cup of coffee and I just finish mm. my, you know. It's ta- go time. It's go time. So I do the move where it's like, oh boy, it's go time. <laughs> I'm not at home. I'm not in the friendly confines Terrifying. in the home, but it's go time. So I go, okay, I'm going to have to try. I'm working out the courtesy flush math. I'm trying to figure yeah. this one out. seat cover? Yeah, I'm doing something? all the math of I'm going to crap up some place where people try to eat and I do this thing where I stand up and I'm starting to stand up and a guy at the table that's just to our right who basically looks like Hurley from Lost he looks like the fucking Arody from Papa Roach like (laughs) big fucking beard big fat guy just wearing chants and everything and long hair you're literally describing my worst nightmare right he gets up and he walks (laughs) He walks past me and into it goes to where the one there's one bathroom. Oh, it's the his and hers. Oh, it's the one bathroom. It's the one bathroom. Oh. And it's like 
I know he's not walking to the other side of the small restaurant and chatting up the table at, near the window. <laughs> yeah, he just got up to go to the bathroom. and I. But I already started the countdown. You've already started let your body mentally know that in 45 seconds I will be sitting I will on be, that throne. I will be on there. Like I've already said, all right, and I've begun so your body the is sequence. Still, and now you have to like stop, put on the brakes, and put right. it in reverse and try and make it go away. It's right. So nightmare. I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh, Christ. <laughs> now... It really gets bad because not only if I began the you know self destruct countdown on this little bowel spaceship I have here, he's gone oh, wow. for 19 minutes. Like I'm oh, like that boy. big husky he's dude with the birth. fucking full beard <laughs> and the crazy hair birth. and the bad tattoos <laughs> is fucking destroying that place. He's painting that place with shit, and I'm just sitting there all the time like, oh Jesus. And you're looking Christ. now across the street at other. Is there anywhere I can leave the restaurant? Or like, what's the near? Is there a furniture place that I can pretend I'm shopping for furniture to use your bathroom? Paquito Moss. By the way, they were going to get a by little the way, more. When you're than, running to the Mexican chain, yes, you, you know, know it's serious. Literally bottomed out. I fucking bottomed <laughs> a out. A lot more. I'm eyeballing the Mexican joint. Of course. I'm just going. I, you yeah. know, I, my people have asked me before if you could be a superhero, what would your power be? And the answer, without flinching, is to control when I could take it. Yeah. Jump. So I'm second. I'm now thinking about standing up and making my way across to the Mexican place to try to use the bathroom over there. I'm doing that thing where it's like a minute You're 14. Sweating. Like, where the fuck is this guy? What yeah. is he doing in there? How many shits can a man take? <laughs> and I'm telling Hench, like, I'm like, okay, I've been sort of sitting on this little secret for you know, 10 minutes here. And I actually it, haven't listened to any of your dialogue. You I'm not sweating thinking about the <laughs> yeah. plot. You're wondering why I haven't been contributing like I normally do. I've been having a fucking shit. I got to take a shit. And this fucking guy, you know, Hench doing the move where he's trying to look, but he's trying not to look, but he's looking behind him a little bit. You know, and I go, he's got a wingman. That, that guy over there has fucking been gone for 18 fucking minutes. And then I go, so I'm about ready to make my move for Paquito Moss. And I see the hair covered behemoth come walking past <laughs> in front of me. Sits down and I go, all right, hand check him. His partner now pops no, up. You His go. partner pops up and start and walks immediately. Out of the thing. I'm like, oh, you guys take turns shitting up restaurants. How's this work? I've been no. in this restaurant 421 times. Hench has never used a bathroom once. I've taken two pisses there. This is this will be You're my not first going shit. there for the bathroom. I know. I'm going there for the <laughs> eggs. I'm just off my bowel clock. I is know. fucked up because I've had too much coffee and I got up too early. And so, it's, by God, where did you go? Now I'm sitting there, and I've I've brought the landing gear back up into the belly of the plane. You know That's what I mean? And I'm circling the airport. It's uncomfortable to do that. I had to crank it up oh, yeah. by hand. You had to. You had, had to, to crank it's it up. Mental harnessing. Yeah. It's horrible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's Hench- like that Memphis Bell movie. I had to crank it up. If Hench was any kind of friend, he would have been the Tom Rathman to your Roger Craig. Just, just lead. Lock, you just lead blow that door. Open. I find that's like trying to fold up a big map. Right. You never. It never folds up. It's never the same. You know. Yeah. It's not like it was. It's actually literally. To bring it back to Earth, this was an Irwin Allen disaster. It movie. really the was. The Inferno, the flames are going up the Inferno, and yes. it's like more all stars kept popping up <laughs> out of the booths. And so I'm sitting there going, There goes Telly Ra- Savalas. Oh, Shelly Winters <laughs> is going in there now. What's the. When's Brown Buttons going to get back from the fucking commode? <laughs> and I'm like, Is he shitting there? Now, my only consolation is, is he's taking the brunt of the yeah. shit load that's t- taking place in there. And so this guy, thankfully, just goes in there. And this guy does something that's wacky. He goes in and comes back so fast. Oh, that means that he I, didn't absorb I don't know if he ma- took a piss or he just or took just one step in and, in and went, oh, no shit, no way. way. And turned around and went, I'll live to piss another day. Oh, so now God. I'm sitting there and I stand up and I go, okay, Hench, I got to move. I got I to gotta move on this. And he goes, don't breathe it in. Like, Don't take it in. But I realize I, I have a kind of nasal Tourette's. So oh, like, I have God. to fucking suck. Like, you well, otherwise, you're going to suck fear. it in your mouth. I mean, I, I, it's coming in It somehow. doesn't matter. I know it. I you're, know you're it's there. It in, like, yeah. I have to fucking sample it. I have to do an ass <laughs> sample. I have to. Do you guys have to? Yeah. Like, you just fucking I ha- have yeah. to. I can't. I've I mastered it. And thank God I can't breathe out my nose sometimes. I've literally, like, the way surfers will walk underwater with a rock. To like right. really learn to control holding their breath. Sure, I like. I saw Blue I, Crush. I practice all year for Coachella <laughs> for when crush. I have to take a piss. Brown I crush. will literally. We're driving and everyone's like, "What bands do you want here?" And I'm like, <gasps> "Yeah." And they're like, "What bands?" And literally, I'm like, "I'm sorry, I was rehearsing mentally for when I have to use go into those porta potties of Coachella." Oh, oh, goddamn! Yeah, it's terrifying. Well, let me Before say I get my horror movie ideas. They. There should be the word, the number one, just the number one porta potty, right? 
Because mm-hmm. there is. It's called the planet. But people, well, I guess for guys. Many, yeah. I guess for guys. All right. Let's. Uh, let's well, what move. happened? What's the resolution? Um, I said I'm making a move. Hench uh, gave me, you know, the uh, like gave me the fist. You know, like not, you know, be strong. He said, don't breathe. Supportive friend. I said I can't do that. Uh, you know, if I'm not back in 20 minutes, you send help. Send in guys after me. I walked in. I didn't smell anything. Wow. Wow. I did not smell anything. I, I don't. I that. don't know what. I don't know what happened. I don't know if he did a double courtesy flush. I did a double courtesy flush, and uh, then the decision. I've done a little damage, not much. It's been <laughs> print, it's been minimal. You know, maybe a three point one earthquake. You know, not not Chile. Yeah. And on now, but I've done a little. It's like okay. Marina Del Rey. Little damage. Double flush. Double courtesy flush. Uh, did something. Curious for you guys ever done this. Now, I realize I'm staring at the Lysol can behind me. If I give a That's shot of the Lysol, it's a it towel. Totally it's a towel. Yeah. It means there's, there's damage done. There's just, there's, it's, it's waning. It's not much. But if someone comes in immediately, it's detectable. I have figured out that if you use enough soap, when you wash <laughs> yeah, your hands, it, you're you kind of it around. wave it around. Like, I'm going to dry my, like, like, God dry my hands. You just get this, this dial sort of smell yeah. through the air. You guys Except know what I'm yeah, talking about? 100%. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> Now we can By the move. way, I'm terrified to touch the Lysol because I think, well, who were the people before me? Why was the situation so bad that they went to the Lysol? Yeah. And what it, are their what was on their hand before they pressed that little button? It's weird. Yet you write right into the mouth of an octopus, but yet, <laughs> yet you won't touch a can I of would Lysol. I touch an octopus in the wild, and I wouldn't touch a can of Lysol. So much bad damn range. Classy Freddie Blassie with my germophobia. Mm, mm. I got to tell you, uh, quickly, <laughs> this is bad timing. Huge, fresh. Juicy berries, cherries, berries, <laughs> dipped in white chocolate, milk chocolate, dark chocolate, rolled in nuts, and <laughs> chips, and chocolate chips. Don't um, picture them. Just trust us. Just they're trust us. They're unbelievable. I mean, you literally, it's a strawberry you eat with a knife and fork. It is un-damn believable. And uh, Mother's Day coming up. Let's make Mama happy. Get her the Sherry's Berries, and it's only nineteen ninety nine. That's over forty percent savings. Let's get it in time for Mother's Day, and uh, get her the beautiful, beautiful. I mean, these things are like like they got hit by gamma radiation. I can't believe what God can do. That it gives me belief in humanity and God. There must be a God if there's a Sherry's Berries. Double the berries for just ten bucks more. Offer ends soon. Go to Berries. That's B E R R I E S dot com. Click on the microphone in the top right corner and type in Ace. All right. Bring it home, baby girl. That's the news. I'm Allison Rosen. Zip it, cunts. That was the news with Allison Rosen. Aftershock, name of the movie, out May 10th in selected theaters. And you can uh, shoot uh, Eli a tweet over at uh, Eli Roth if you like. And uh, Eli, always a delight. Oh, thanks, man. It's a pleasure to be here. Come back anytime you like, I my shall. brother. So until next time, it's Adam Carolla for Ray Oldhofer, Eli Roth, Alison Rosen, and Bald Brian saying mahalo. Hey, kitties, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and catch any podcasts you might have missed at youtube.com slash Adam Carolla. That's youtube.com slash me.